sponsor of Senate Bill 116, which passed the Senate in early February. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't thank my fellow uh, sponsors, Representative J.R. Hall and Senator David Hu. Um, this bill, so-called constitutional carry bill, does four things. Uh, it allows a person, unless they are otherwise prohibited from owning a firearm, it allows that person to carry a concealed weapon without a permit. The second thing it does is repeal the requirement that a New Hampshire citizen seek a permit to carry on a concealed basis. The third thing it does is um, require the state police to negotiate to the extent they can reciprocity agreements with other states so that New Hampshire residents can legally carry a concealed weapon in those states and um, on a voluntary basis if one chooses to continue to have a permit to carry a concealed weapon which would be uh, necessary in some other states um, this legislation would extend the period of time for four to five years that that permit was eligible. Um, let me touch base on what I think the importance of this bill is. Uh, clearly, as Americans, we have a right on an individual basis under the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution to keep and bear arms. The New Hampshire Constitution <coughs> is even stronger as under the language of our Constitution, all New Hampshire citizens have a right not only to keep and bear arms, but specifically in defense of themselves, their families, and the state. That's Article 2A of our Constitution. So I would argue that this legislation is a common sense piece of legislation. What it does not do is expand the number of firearms that one is legally entitled to have, nor does it expand in any way the individuals that are legally entitled to own a firearm. It is silent on both of those subjects, so it doesn't expand, it doesn't attract that. It also should be noted that New Hampshire is a so-called open carry state, that if you're legally entitled to own a firearm that's your uh, that's a legal firearm to own, you can openly carry in New Hampshire under our laws today. And so the question is, why would we not extend that same right, what I would argue is a constitutional right, to law-abiding citizens to carry on a concealed basis, which is how most people choose to, if they choose to carry a pistol or a revolver, that they would choose to carry on a concealed basis. Why not extend that same constitutional protection to law-abiding citizens? Currently, um, under RSA 159.6, which is the governing statute in this case, in order to receive that permit from the permitting authorities, generally the local police chief, a person must <coughs> be deemed suitable. And so this legislation has become even more important given a 2013 New Hampshire Supreme Court decision, Doyon versus Hooksett, that ruled that um, the permitting authority has discretion as to what constitutes a suitable person because 159.6 does not spell that out. It doesn't define it. And so um, given that ruling, it is possible that there could be delays or denials of this concealed permit to folks that are legally entitled to own a legal weapon and, and carry it on a concealed basis. So I think the question that I asked as the sponsor of the bill, um, is, is passage of this bill going to cause harm in any way? And I think the answer to that is no. Criminals quite frankly, are not going to be deterred from committing a violent crime with a firearm because of lack of a permit that they might not have, which is only a misdemeanor for first offense for failing to get a concealed carry permit. Somebody intent on committing a crime with a firearm is, quite frankly, likely to commit a crime with a firearm. And those are the folks, at least in my opinion, 
that criminals need to be dealt with as criminals, not restricting the rights of law-abiding citizens in order to deal with criminals that are not likely to be dissuaded in any manner or form uh, by the requirement to get a concealed permit. So the question that comes out of the first question, will passage cause harm? The second question I think then is, should be asked as well, okay, will New Hampshire be less safe if we pass Senate Bill 116? And I think the answer is very likely we will in fact be safer. Um, it should be noted that violent crime in this country has dropped by about 4.4% um, in 2013 and over the previous decade has declined by uh, 15%. That's not New Hampshire statistics, those are national statistics. It's a, it's a good thing, clearly, and probably any number of factors that um, have contributed to that decline. But one of the factors that needs to be taken into account is more and more Americans have availed themselves of the right under the Second Amendment to protect their lives, their liberties, and their loved ones by owning and possessing a firearm. But let's look at New Hampshire. We're very fortunate to be the, according to the FBI statistics, the sixth safest state in the country in terms of violent crime. Again, there are probably any number of factors that contribute to that uh, good ranking of sixth. Fairly low poverty rating, fairly high income levels, educated public. But again, I would submit to you that owning a firearm, and we are a state that's relatively friendly toward the Second Amendment, especially in light of our uh, Constitution, Article 2A, owning a firearm plays a role in the fact that we are among the safest states in the nation. But we need to look, when we're considering this legislation, at our neighbor to the west, Vermont. Vermont has not had a permit requirement for concealed carry since the inception of their state's constitution. So for over 200 years, they have not required a, a permit. It is by right in Vermont that one can carry a pistol or revolver on a concealed basis. They're the safest state in the nation. And I would submit to you, my fellow colleagues, that um, this is likely to enhance safety, not deter it. Vermont, we share similar demographics, similar geography. Um, Vermont should be an example for what is likely to happen if we proceed with <coughs> this legislation. Now, I've given the chair an amendment and I gave the Representative Welch copies of the amendment um, that you can distribute to committee members and for members of the public. I have a few extra copies here. Um, it, it, was brought up in the Senate that um, a small change would be necessary um, in order, and this was brought up by law enforcement, um, that there was some question as to whether local law enforcement in New Hampshire could enforce federal statute. And so if you look at the amendment on lines 11 and 12, it spells out clearly that New Hampshire law enforcement can enforce federal laws. And so that involves domestic violence, drug crimes, um, and the like, where um, one could lose their constitutional right if they had committed such a crime uh, to carry. And so this language was implicit, I think, in the Senate version of Senate Bill 116. If you adopt this amendment, you will make it explicit and I think address one of the concerns of, of the law enforcement folks who testified. So um, I commend it to you and, and ask for um, a favorable reaction to it. Thank you and happy to answer questions. <coughs> uh, Senator Bell, uh, Bradley, uh, would this have any effect on <coughs> colleges? <coughs> students when that be again representative as I said before this doesn't affect any category of firearm that um, may not be legal to own or affect any category of firearm that's legal to own silent and it does not affect um, who's entitled to own a firearm you're either entitled to own a firearm or you're not 
And so um, it, as well it should be, is silent on that. It doesn't expand or um, curtail any of those um, rights or responsibilities. Uh, I was just curious to whether uh, college students would be able to care since they are all of 18. I think it would depend on the situation at the university. If there was a prohibition of um, gun ownership, then the prohibition of gun ownership would stand under this. If there wasn't, then the um, it would be what it would be. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing that, thank you very much. Senator. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Jim McDonald, Representative Cheshire 12, and I'm here in support of the bill. Um, I want to be very brief, but I do want to point out that constitutional carry is something that is going across the nation at a pretty rapid pace. There are now five states across the nation that uh, have some form of constitutional carry, some with some restrictions, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, Vermont, and Wyoming. In Wyoming, for example, it's strictly residents. And if you're going to carry in Wyoming, you have to have a uh, permit that allows that you have to have a concealed carry permit in the state that you come from. But in any event, there are quite a number of states, as I say, five that now have constitutional carry one form or another. And there are 23 states, 22 states, that have considered it this year or are considering it. Uh, one of them has uh, just been vetoed in West Virginia by the governor there. But uh, things, I understand, look pretty good in quite a number of the other states, including Maine, right next door. I think this is a bill that's time has come. I think it's an excellent uh, bill. I hope that you will support it. I believe that uh, most firearms laws do not really work. It's a case of the law abiding obeying them and those who choose not to obey the law ignoring them. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the testimony on that. On that West Virginia item, were yes. you aware, according to the newspapers, that a poll of the state, 83% of the state residents were opposed to the elimination of the permit process? Well, I wasn't aware of that poll, but I think in many cases, my experience has been, it depends on how you ask the question, but the long and the short of it is the governor's just vetoed it in West Virginia, so I presume they'll be considering it again. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing that, thank you very much. Thank you. Representative Balasaro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and fellow representatives. And it'll be real quick for the record, Representative Al Baldassau, Rockingham County, uh, District 5, which is London. Area. <coughs> Senator Bradley gave you some information on what's going on with this here on the safest states in the country. If you take a look at Detroit, with all the crime they've had years ago with their real strict gun laws, I believe a new chief of police that came in and told everyone to um, arm themselves protect themselves. Their crime has dropped drastically. If you look at Plano, Texas, where they say 80, 85 percent of the homes in Plano, Texas have guns, their murder rate is probably one of the lowest in the country. If you look at Vermont, like the senator said, for over 200 years over, they've had this law in place, and it's not the shootout at the OK Corral. <coughs> it's one of the say it is the safest state in the country. This is a no-brainer, this bill here. I have a constitutional right to own and carry without asking a chief of police, which many of them come out of state, naturally they're not going to support this, but to ask him for permission to exercise my constitutional right to carry, to protect myself, protect my family, or protect others. I'm a true believer in paragraph A and deadly force is to protect myself by reason to believe that I need a danger of death or serious bodily harm. And in paragraph B goes in to protect others under deadly force. Now you're going to probably hear today some are going to come and tell you the sky's going to fall if we pass this here. People will start shooting, uh, you know, left and right. 
same old scare tactics we've been hearing for a long, long time. It's about time that we, that elected by the people, give the people back their rights to carry, to protect themselves, without asking permission. Criminals, they don't care. They don't need to go to the police department. They're going to carry no matter what. But they're breaking the law. So why do we need something, a permit, to run a law-abiding citizen when we have every right to protect ourselves? So I'm asking you to definitely support this bill here. Let's move forward there because this has long been long gone, long enough, and we owe it to the state to make sure that every individual has the right to protect themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Balbasaro, for your testimony. I just have a quick question. I said, I just have a quick question. How do I answer to my constituents who are saying, we do not want to carry a gun, or we do not? So is this a message that we are saying, if you cannot protect yourself with your own gun, is that New Hampshire is not a state for you to live? Well, let me, let me help you out real quick here, okay? I'll put the U.S. Constitution away. I won't even go into that. I'll write some that will be free. Show the Constitution, educate your constituents, and say what's beautiful about being American, you have a choice. Many veterans died for this, for our rights. So if you have some constituents that don't want to carry, God love them. Their next door neighbor will probably protect them. Any further questions? Can I just, could I understand that as uh, if I had a problem, somebody came in my yard and they're shooting and I'm going to call my neighbor instead of the police no. to protect me? That's no, what I, I understood. Think, no, well, I think about what the question that you just asked, that somebody came into your yard, your neighbor will come in. I, if I know my neighbor was having issues across the street, because once again, paragraph B, is to protect others if you reasonably believe that they're in immediate danger or death or serious bodily harm. So if I seen in view there was a crisis going on in my neighbor, I owe it to my neighbor because the police department is anywhere from six minutes to hours away, depending where you live. Okay? They, they cannot be there to protect you every moment of the day. So follow up, follow up. If, if there was a domestic your neighbors are fighting. You think that if you saw something unusual, you may be at least pull out your gun and shoot someone. Did, did I ever say that, that Representative? Well, that's the way I uh, understand you saying that. Okay. Representative, I feel bad that you think that way, and I'm hoping I can clarify it for you, but I think this will be the wrong setting for it. Maybe we can sit down and have a cup of coffee, and I can explain you on proper procedures and deadly force. If you look at standing your ground, if you are the aggressor, okay, you're the wrong person. You're really, it's illegal. But, I'll settle for a diet. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I don't have a lot of problems with what you're saying, but how do we prevent the people who have their guns and leave them at home so a four-year-old kills his mother? Shouldn't there be some restrictions on if you're going to have small arms in your house that they have to be uh, somewhere where a four-year-old can't get at it? You know, that, that has nothing to do with this bill. Right. All like the kid the has to do with statute. Statute. It's already in statute. This bill basically is, is to about concealed carry, not about home safety. We're discussing... Well, there are all limits on what you can do with a gun. And uh, what well, I'm saying is how do we enforce that? Mr. Chairman, I can answer him real quick. I mean, how can you enforce uh, somebody who's driving a car to kill somebody that left the house as a young kid? Three kids on my street in Texas. I don't let it drive kill. the car. They have no control. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Am I all set? Thank you. Representative Burton. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I speak today in opposition to the bill. Like, like the previous speaker, I strongly believe in constitutional rights. 
And as a Vietnam veteran, I fought for those rights for the 1950 revision in, in, the, in the Mekong Delta. And I believe in constitutional rights. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. One of my rights as a bystander crossed with the rights of someone to carry a concealed weapon. When I'm as likely to get hurt by someone with a concealed weapon as I am by an active shooter. I think what scared me most on organization day was those arguing for concealed weapons on the floor of the house argued they wanted them concealed because that way if an active shooter came in, the active shooter wouldn't know who to shoot at because the guys with the guns or the women would pull their guns out and start shooting back. That was really unquieting for me, but that's what was said. And that's the condition we have in society as a whole. What about my bystanders' rights? I went to see the sergeant at arms, and I said, do you know who's carrying a weapon on the floor of the New Hampshire house? He said, no, we don't ask. He said, well, how do you have a plan to deal with an active shooter? I was president of a college, we had an active shooter plan, and the whole idea is you have to have control who is shooting and who they're shooting at. We don't even have that in the New Hampshire house. We don't have it in the state. I would respect people more if they carry their guns outside. Why not make it Dodge City? So at least I know who's got a gun and who doesn't, and then I can get away from them because I'm as liable to be shot by one of them. I'm one of the few people who actually saw what an active shooter scene can do because we had a false alarm at my college with 900 people in the building, and the speaker came on and said, there's an active shooter. There was absolute chaos. And if some of those people had had a gun, I'm sure they might have started firing until we got the, the voice on the mail on the about speakers saying it, it's, a, it's, it's a false alarm. If, uh, the t and the state police will be there in a minute. My police officers, who I won't allow to carry guns because the data shows they're more liable to shoot each other than, than, than a perpetrator. Um, I think it's not too much <coughs> to ask for my rights as a bystander <coughs> for our police to know who's carrying a concealed weapon in my town. Just so I know. And I I, I would urge you to, to oppose the bill. I think it goes too far, and, and that uh, if someone I, I, the right to carry a gun or own a gun, that's fine. But I have rights too, and I, I have a right to know, especially in the legislature, who around me is carrying a concealed weapon and might pull it out and start shooting at somebody. I can tell you that the, the data on active shooters is that it's hard to tell who they are. We were instructed to walk out of the building like this so the police would know who, who the shooters were. It's, it's chaos. And I think professional law officers carry weapons, and civilians who are not trained in police work should have to at least get a license so, so that people know who they are. And I, I thank you very much. I have great respect for this committee having served today on it. I respect everyone, but please, a little common sense. My wife went to the training session with me the other day. And, and somebody talked about the fact that some of the reps were carrying weapons. And my wife was sick. She said, you've got to be kidding me. I didn't know state reps carry weapons in the state house. What's wrong? What's wrong with this picture? She was physically ill to learn that somebody right near her was carrying a gun. And it, it, why, why don't you know about this? I said, we don't. We don't know who they are. Just some of them do. That's the way <coughs> it works. Well, anyway, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate your uh, hearing me out. I'd be happy to ask a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank you for representing the peace-loving population that still continues to live in this state. Thank you, Representative. Representative Burke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As a peace-loving person, state representative from Goffstown, uh, I was the one that put the amendment in to allow guns on the House floor. Do you also are aware that, are you aware, that's the question, that I also put in for open carry and that was defeated by your colleagues? Well, and I, and I, and I voted against open carry. I didn't say I was for Dodge City and the State House. I said, but if you're going to do it, at least carry them outside so we know who you are. But, well, you should, why don't you bring an M16 and put it on your shoulder? I mean, why are you, are you concerned that, because somebody said, why do you have concealed weapons? You know what the answer was? Because it makes people feel nervous if they see the watch. I told him, and it was one of the state reps, I get more nervous when it's under your coat. Put it out there. Let's know what it is. Let's see it. Are you ashamed of carrying a gun? It's so important to you 
Do you know the chances of you actually have to use that weapon in our society are pretty slim, I would think. But uh, sure, I voted against the open carry too because I'm not, I'm not carrying a gun, okay? And I don't think I should have to in our country. What does it say about our country when, when we're at this situation? Thank you for your question. Seeing no further questions, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Representative Hannah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, members of the committee. Uh, I would have to agree uh, with uh, the last statement uh, we heard mm -hmm. that no one should have to carry a gun in this country. And I think uh, no one would disagree with that. The question isn't whether we uh, should have to. The question is whether we are allowed to. Do we have to ask permission to do that? Do we have to ask permission to use our free speech rights? Do we have to ask for permission to uh, vote? We don't have to ask permission to do these things. This law, and I've said this before, this law does nothing to prohibit law-abiding people from getting, to, from carrying a concealed weapon, whether it's open or concealed. We're already allowed to openly carry. Criminals are already allowed to do whatever they want because they're going to just conceal it. Um, you know, whether we have a law saying they can't do it, it's not stopping them. This law only affects law-abiding people. If somebody is a prohibited person, they are not allowed to carry a concealed, even with a permit in this state. They can lie, they can get through the system somehow, get a permit, but if they are any one of those prohibited um, categories on the federal, from the federal level, they are not allowed to do this. So this bill would do absolutely nothing to keep those prohibited people from carrying concealed or not. Or it was not gonna give them permission to do it. They're not allowed. So <coughs> this is almost, um, it's kind of uh, silly that we're even discussing this because this is not something that is going to make one bit of difference to the criminals. This is only going to give more freedom and less red tape to the people who are already allowed to carry concealed if they just pay a fine. I'm sorry, a fee. <laughs> <laughs> Real quick, okay. I just wanted to know, could someone here today tell me what the problem is in New Hampshire? why everybody has to carry their guns like that, concealed. What is the problem? I haven't seen one problem. You don't have, have to. you? Uh, uh, well, we've heard that no one ever, you know, it's so rare to have an active shooter event or how, how rare it is to have to use a firearm. Uh, I've said this in the past and I'll, I'll reiterate it. I've actually had to use a firearm to save my life and my child's life. Okay, we were attacked by a vicious drug dealer's dog. It tore my poor dog to pieces and my four month old baby was being raced home in a stroller by my wife. And I had to defend myself from this dog that was, the head was bigger than me. And I feel horrible about it, but I had to defend us. You know, I had a, a high capacity magazine that had many, many bullets. I used one, I stopped the situation, and then I went home. Everyone was fine, except for the dog who had a bad limp. Um, we don't have to do this. And I didn't have to have a gun that day. I could have let the dog eat my child. So I, I don't, disagree by saying, I'm not saying that we have to do this, I'm saying it's not anyone else's decision whether or how or when I get to defend my life and my children's life, my wife's life, and you know, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't have to ask to do that. Representative Yeah, uh, would you be opposed to us um, uh, passing this bill and doing away with concealed weapons altogether? that you had to carry them out in the open? I, we can already carry openly, so there's no point whatsoever to do that. I know that, so why? Follow up? Follow up, why should we even uh, bother with concealed weapons? They just have to be out in the open. I mean, this has already been discussed. I believe your, your party has already been drastically against this. My past. party? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't want to make it a partisan issue because this is, it shouldn't be and I apologize, but this is something that's been discussed. We've, al we've already heard, uh, we've heard Senator Carson say in the Senate, you know, le uh, legal, illegal, legal, illegal. I mean, we're talking about just covering something up. You'd like to see them is what you're saying? Propose a bill and I'd love to discuss it. We do co-sponsor it, I don't see the need. We already have it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, 
Would this impact, uh, you know, today that we uh, are required, you know, not to bring in a weapon, let's say if we go into courts, and et cetera, would that still be in place or would this affect, would you be able to carry if this bill was to pass in the courts? No, uh, it's, we already know that that's not the case. And I remember hearing the argument on the floor when the, the House rule uh, was discussed about how courts are, firearms are banned in courts. Well, that is uh, categorically not true. There, is a, there are rules against it, but a judge is allowed to bring one into his own courtroom if he wishes to, I believe, in, in any courtroom. Uh, he, I, it depends on whether they're allowed to let other people have one or not, but your average person isn't going to go in even with or without a permit or without, if you don't have a permit, you can't, we are already allowed to legally open carry. You still can't openly carry into a courtroom in the state, even though it's legal to openly carry. So the fact whether you put your coat over it or not still does not give you permission to enter that courtroom if they have their own rules. A follow up real fast. Follow up. That, that is, uh, we have to go through a, a, some sort of a machine to check and see if we're carrying the weapon or whatever. Then, of the facilities, but that's still be in effect. Yes. Unless someone added, unless uh, one of the members uh, added an amendment to the, to the contrary, I don't see you okay. it. Having, been, having worked as a bailiff in court, weapons are prohibited in the court and in the courtroom past the magnetometer unless you're a law enforcement officer. Take so, the same and it would not change. Just like a private business has a right to tell people that they can't carry guns in their private business. They have that right. That will not change. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Representative. Either one. Any further questions? <laughs> Representative Martin. Uh, just one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative, for your testimony. Uh, I've always disliked the analogy where carrying concealed weapons is going to lead to a uh, uh, Dodge City gunfight at the old K Corral situation. So I'd like to ask you something that's more real world. Recently, a hundred of our military members have had their names, faces, and addresses published on an Islamic website and have been targeted for killing. Do you think, I don't know if any of them live in New Hampshire, but do you think this bill would enhance their ability to protect themselves and their family? I, I don't see how it could hurt them in any way. It could only help. Uh, I mean, it's, it goes to the, the whole, we really don't have extended waiting periods like some states like California and other places. Um, and when you have to wait for something, say a battered woman has to, is worried that she's going to be killed or has a threat against her, or anybody who has a threat against them has to wait to get something, that puts them at risk. So the fact that this gets rid of that period, however brief it may be in this state, is only a positive. It can only help people. If I was on a list that people wanted to kill me, I'd like to know that I could defend myself now and not have to wait for anybody's permission. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Seeing no further questions, thank you very much. Thank you very much. David Goldstein. Joe Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is David Goldstein. I'm the Chief of Police in the City of Franklin, New Hampshire. Uh, I represent the New Hampshire Association of Chiefs of Police, and we object to this bill. I will be extremely brief because I know you have a long day ahead of you. Our testimony essentially is on record, and um, I do have some additional testimony and supporting documentation for the committee because Representative Fields said I could bring it. Um, and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. I'm working with this bill and having a problem with the fact that a chief of police or somebody in authority decides to choose whether somebody is or is not suitable to have a concealed weapon. And I find that totally subjective on another human being's part to decide whether a woman who's been threatened and wants to have a concealed weapon and she has to wait something in the order of 14 days and yet that woman is not going to walk out of the house packing a gun, she's already bought it, on her hip. I don't know of any woman that to, to, to do that. So the, the sheriff may or may not give her a permit, and I find that objectionable that he gets to make that choice. Yes. 
why do we allow somebody to make that choice for another person? Well, <clears throat> I think I can answer that on two levels. One is a very general level uh, that is very indicative of what's going on here. You're making choices for people all the time. Subjective choices in many cases. So I think that that is part of the human condition. But on a more specific level, um, if it's a 14 day waiting, it's not a waiting period, it's the time that it takes to generate the paperwork to make sure that the individual is, to use your term, suitable. And it does not prohibit that woman from carrying a gun, open carry. We still have that in the state. If she chooses not to, because she's a woman, that's her decision. Nobody's going to tell her she can't. If my wife or my daughter decide to carry open, they'll carry open. They have, they have permits, but they'll carry open. So I think that we're getting into a little bit of apples and oranges here. And when we talk about suitability, what we do have is the fact that most of your local police chiefs can go to sources that tell us a little bit about the individuals that we might not otherwise know. And I'll give the committee a, a very specific example. I have a family in town who should not <coughs> carry guns, period. Now, they are both psychiatrically compromised, in my opinion. And for those of you who know me on the committee, you know that I can say a little bit of that with authority. So my question is, do I give them a gun? They haven't been adjudicated, so they don't meet the criteria of a federal prohibition or even a state prohibition. But I know, as does the judge in the Franklin Circuit Court, know that these individuals should not be carrying a firearm in any way, shape, or form. So I know, are they suitable? Absolutely not. If a woman comes to me and says, I have a domestic violence problem, I would like a concealed carry license, sure, why not? Why not? There seems to be this overriding feeling in the room that we're in such need of being in such control of the people that live in our, our communities, which is absolutely fallacious. To the contrary, I can tell you that the chiefs work very closely with the people in their communities, and we try to protect them. So I don't buy your arguments. Follow up? Follow up. Thank you. Are you aware of the recent Supreme Court ruling on the gentleman from Nashua, where the chief of police said, can't have a concealed weapon and the Supreme Court of New Hampshire overturned them? Sure. I'm also aware of other decisions where the courts have supported Chief's decisions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chief, for your testimony. Um, a couple of moments ago when you said, in your opinion, uh, members of the family should not carry guns, I saw kind of a ripple of reaction to that comment about in my opinion. So I wondered if you could speak briefly as to how you arrived, without getting into obviously private matters, but how you arrived at that opinion so it doesn't seem arbitrary. Right? Well, first of all, you have to realize that New Hampshire has one of the least restrictive, uh, if you will, methods of trying to research an individual that applies for a carry license. Uh, we don't, we can't have fingerprints, we don't have photographs. The best that I can do is run a criminal record check, a motor vehicle record check, ask, as the form indicates, ask for three references, and there are predicate questions on the form that have to be answered, and then Further, I can go to individuals in my department who have institutional knowledge and ask them for help. And that's it. So that's how you arrive at your opinion. It's not, obviously. Not. And that's typical of how you approach any Correct. Based on the form. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chief, for coming here today. Chief, anecdotally, it doesn't have to be empirical. How many permits have you denied in your 30, 35 years as a as a law enforcement officer, especially as chief, how many of you denied that that people have applied for the permit process? I would say less than a dozen. Give, give me a percentage, if you could. Uh, that oh. might be somewhere around. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Less than a percent. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ralph D'Amico, representative. <coughs> I didn't recognize you with your <laughs> incognito. Yeah. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you for having us. Um, I'm going to depart just a little bit uh, and go to the Bible. 
Crime in the United States, uniform uh, crime report as it used to be known, once published by the FBI, and then they got out of the printing business. And uh, Senator Bradley made reference to some statistics. I think he was conservative in some of his uh, estimates as to the reduction in crime in this country. Uh, according to the Bible, over the last 10 years, there's been a close to 40% decline in violent crime. Violent crime uh, is what uh, we think about when we think of firearms. This committee being uh, oriented in the uh, public protection uh, philosophy uh, concerns itself with these. And you know, violent crime is murder, non negligent manslaughter, rape, robbery, and aggravated assault. So to have a 40% or so decline in the last 10 years indicates that I think probably our law enforcement community is doing a heck of a bang up job. Further, rates per 100,000 population uh, of violent crime, we are the third lowest in the, in the country. Uh, Senator Bradley might have a more updated version that puts us at second. Um, Maine being the first with 123 violent crimes per 100,000 population. Vermont being second with 132. And New Hampshire being third. Now we could look at places like Tennessee, which has 608 per 100,000, and Washington, D.C., which is off the charts at 1,202. So to sum it up, I think the state of New Hampshire is, in a, is in an enviable place in terms of nonviolent crime. Our law enforcement, I think, does a fabulous job. Um, we don't have, uh, we have about the average number of police officers uh, per capita uh, unlike some states that have five or six hundred uh, per one hundred thousand people, uh, we have uh, three hundred, four hundred and forty. So we're, we're, we're not, we're doing a great job. Um, murder, uh, which is the big, uh, the big thing that everyone looks at. Uh, New Hampshire had in this report, which is two years old, uh, 16 murders, uh, one by handgun, uh, four by uh, other weapon, uh, firearms, and the rest miscellaneous means. To say that we shouldn't be concerned about violent crime is, 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 is false. We should. But we are. I think we're on point in this state. Um, I believe we're doing a, a terrific job. Uh, I am, am for passage of this bill. Because I don't think any one of us sitting here today can deny that there are bad guys right now, right out there, carrying guns, who can't get permits, and who don't have permits. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Anthony Nino, Nino, is it? I'll put you your name, sir. I'm sorry. That's all right. I'm good at that. I had one of my experts. Eight years of military service, I've been called many things. <laughs> so have I. <laughs> my name is Anthony J. Nino, Jr. I'm from Amherst, New Hampshire. I'm representing myself. I'm here to testify in, uh, in favor of this bill. And um, I, I sent uh, an email to everyone on the committee last night. And I, I can understand if you didn't read it because you're probably deluged with, with emails. But what I'm going to do is I have a, a copy of it here and I'll submit it after my testimony. I'm not going to read the two pages of it. I'm just going to summarize it. Um, just uh, now. We hear a lot of poll results. Newspaper poll says this. Um, this organization says that. And uh, the first thing that always comes to mind is who, is who is this organization and how many people did they poll? What were the questions? Is this a push poll? I don't care if it's pro or con. I always have these questions. As, uh, as an ex-military policeman, I'm suspicious by nature. So what I did is um, I looked at two polls, one by PBS.com. I love PBS. My kids have grown up watching their uh, shows. I've donated to them. I listen to NPR. And I know that generally speaking, PBS and NPR are, uh, they're not pro-gun. Let me just say that. Well, PBS.com did a poll of over 127,000 viewers. And the simple question was, would you support more restrictions on guns in your state? And uh, in the email, there is a direct reference and a link that you can go to this poll. 
The, uh, the first uh, selection was yes, increased re regulations on firearms are necessary to prevent another tragedy like the shooting at Sandy Hook. That was the first choice. 4.17%, 4% said yes. The second choice was no, laws like this unnecessarily punish lawful gun owners <coughs> and will do little to prevent mass shootings. 94.68% chose no. 1.5, uh, excuse me, 1.15 said that they were unsure. And this, uh, if you go to this poll, you will see that uh, you cannot vote twice. You track your IP address. That's something I also do to online polls. I test them out. If I can vote twice, I say, forget it. There's somebody sitting at the terminal just gaming the system. And you can't game this system. The second poll was by uh, police.com. It's an online community of over 200,000 certified police officers. If you claim to be a police officer, they're going to make the call. And if you've lied, they'll beat you right off. So they had, uh, they had 11 different questions, and I'm not going to read them, but I, I will take a few excerpts from the summary. The overwhelming majority, almost 90% of officers, believe that casualties would be decreased if armed citizens were present at the onset of an active shooter incident. Contrary to what the mainstream media, and this is from the website, contrary to what the mainstream media and certain politicians would have us believe, police overwhelmingly favor an armed citizenry, would like to see more guns in the hands of responsible people, and are skepti skeptical of any greater restrictions placed on gun purchase, ownership, or accessibility. And lastly, they, uh, one of the questions asked them uh, for different measures. Okay, and there were eight selections. The, uh, when asked what would help prevent shootings in public, the number one choice was, quote, more permissive concealed carry policies for civilians, unquote. And that is exactly what this bill is proposing. Now, I've heard a few questions, uh, one by Representative Fields, and I'd like to address your question if I may. And that was, what, what makes me feel that I have to carry? I walk with a limp on a good day. I have two bad knees. I walk with a cane 90% of the time. And about 75% of the time, I wear leg braces. Wherever I go, I have a sign on me that says mug me. I'm not going to walk around with a sign that says mug me, willingly. But unfortunately, to walk around, I have to. Because disabled people are targets, elderly and disabled. And that is why I carry. I'd like to field any questions that anyone may have. Seeing none, thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Can I have that written yes, paper? Yes, absolutely. You can have both of them. Thank you. And it, um, like I said, if you look for my email, you have the clickable links that will allow you to go to each of the uh, polls. Robert Clegg. Oh, he had to go to another committee. He said he'd be back. And we'll put him aside. Representative Berrien? Representative Berrien had to go to the next meeting to ask questions. We'll do is we'll make copies of that and make sure all the committee members have it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Was he in support or opposed? He is opposed to the bill. Opposition. Ian Underwood. Hi. Thanks for giving me the chance to speak. My name's Ian Underwood. I'm from Croydon. Uh, I represent myself, but also a dwindling constituency of people who believe that. Either words mean something, or laws, which are made of words, do not. Um, Article 8 of the New Hampshire Constitution, which doesn't get a lot of play, makes it clear that you guys are not our leaders, even if you like to think of yourselves that way. You're our substitutes and agents. A substitute can't have more power than the original. And so you can really only do as a group what any person could do on his own, which does not include forcing other people to ask for permission to carry a concealed gun. And to keep you from even pretending that you can do that, Article 2A of the New Hampshire Constitution protects the right of all persons, not just suitable persons, 
to keep and bear arms, <coughs> without leaving any room for restrictions on who can exercise that right or in what manner. So you really had no power to restrict that right in the first place, which means that you really should pass this bill after amending it to replace the term license, which will no longer apply, with a more accurate term like certificate of reciprocity. But on the other hand, it's kind of shameful that you even have to do this. So you may hear people like Senator David Pierce dismiss what I've just said as a strict reading of Articles 8 and 2A, and I'd like to talk about that today. A strict reading simply means assigning meaning to a sentence based on the words that it contains. <coughs> What's the alternative? If the meaning of a constitution isn't in the words it contains, then where is it? If the words don't matter, why write them down in the first place? You'll actually hear Senator Pierce at times argue that under this kind of strict reading, several existing statutes violate the Constitution, and that, therefore, the Constitution can't possibly mean what it says, because what it says conflicts with laws that were passed in open defiance of it. <coughs> Seriously, according to Senator Pierce, all you have to do to amend the Constitution is to enact a statute that conflicts with it and the statute will take priority. And that's such a remarkable claim that I think it bears repeating. According to Senator Pierce, to amend the Constitution, all you have to do is ignore it. You may also hear Senator Pierce say that this kind of strict reading doesn't balance interests, in this case, between individual rights and public <coughs> safety. And he's right, it doesn't balance interests. But that's the whole point of absolute phrasing like all persons. In contrast, Consider the Fourth Amendment, which strikes a balance between an individual right to privacy and a government interest in prosecuting crimes. It doesn't say you have the right not to be searched. It says you can't be searched without probable cause. The First Amendment doesn't say you have the right to assemble. It says you have the right to assemble peaceably. The Third Amendment doesn't say soldiers can't be quartered in your house. It says it can only be done in time of war as prescribed by law, and so on, and so on. So there's no shortage of examples where our Constitution strike a balance between individual rights and government interests. The people who wrote those documents understood the difference between all and all except. They understood the difference between not and not unless. So when someone like Senator Pierce argues that absolute phrasing like all persons couldn't possibly have been intended to create an absolute provision, prohibition on government power, that isn't just an assault on our rights. It's an insult to our intelligence. And it's not like the authors of those constitutions didn't provide mechanisms to correct any lack of foresight on their part by amending those constitutions. For example, here's one way that you guys might amend Article 2A to provide the kind of balance that Senator Pierce seems to be searching for. All persons of voting age who have not been disqualified in a manner prescribed by law and subject to due process may, upon receipt of the necessary licenses, keep arms approved by the legislature and bear them in a manner approved by the legislature. That's one way you can do it. You could just put the word suitable in there. All suitable persons have the right to keep and bear arms. But the point is, if you just leave those words in place and you pretend that they have shades of meaning that they don't have, that all doesn't actually mean all, if you allow and even encourage judges to redefine the most basic words so that they can bend the Constitution into alignment with existing statutes, rather than eliminating statutes that are out of alignment with the Constitution, then it becomes literally and I'm not exaggerating, impossible to write a law that just means what it says, and that makes it impossible for any citizen to know what the law means just by reading it. And that isn't making law. That is unmaking the very possibility of law. And if it sounds like I'm overstating the case, I'd like you to imagine that we amend the Constitution to say, Article 103, having already considered the balance between individual rights and any conceivable state interest, compelling or otherwise, and without any ifs, buts, and lesses, or whereases, no magistrate or officer of government may, under any circumstances, rape any person. And now let's ask a simple legal question. Would this allow a police officer to rape a convicted felon at a traffic stop? I think it's the position of Senator Pierce that he would not be able to answer that question without first checking to see what the courts have <coughs> to say. After all, the courts have already held that person in Article 2A excludes convicted felons. So maybe they'd say the same thing about Article 103. Or maybe they'd say that it's not rape if you're in uniform. That seems ridiculous, but they've held in the past that the police can do all kinds of things with impunity that would land any of us in prison. And furthermore, I believe it's the position of Senator Pierce and other people who agree with him that if the courts were to say that it is allowed, he would accept that without question. 
So this is where we've ended up, at the point where it's not even possible to use the Constitution to place an absolute prohibition on government power without instead creating a framework that explains how the government is going to exercise the power it's not supposed to have. And if you think this isn't a realistic description of the situation, consider that this is exactly what's happened with Article 2A. And this is exactly why we're sitting here today. And when Senator Pierce argues against strict reading, this is what he's arguing for. But disregarding strict reading is a dangerous game. It may or may not have occurred to you that if the words of the Constitution that limit the powers of government don't mean anything, then neither do the words that create those powers. That is, when you ignore the words of articles like 8 and 2A, you're actually inviting everyone else to ignore the words of statutes and judicial opinions. So you may manage to pass some laws, but only at the expense of undermining the rule of law itself. And perhaps more importantly, when you ignore articles like 8 and 2A, you invite everyone else to invoke Article 10, which of course protects the right of revolution. I don't really expect anything I've said today to change any of your minds, but still, I think it's important that other people know that you've heard it. That way, when the tar and feathers come out later, you won't be able to claim that you weren't aware of what you were doing. So thank you for listening. Can I have um, I can email this to you. I have notes that I want to keep. But if... Maybe you could see the secretary in here. Who is? Okay. Out to her. Sure. So the whole committee can have. Absolutely. It. Thank you. Happy to do that. Seeing no questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> questions today make me want to talk about fear and how this bill um, addresses that. Um, I would ask, does the Constitution still apply even when we're afraid? Or is fear sufficient justification for ignoring the plain language of the Constitution instead of taking the trouble to amend it? I wouldn't think so, but let's look at the practical implications of passing this bill to see what kind of fear we're actually talking about. As I figure it, there are four categories of people who are affected by this bill. One, people who qualify for a license now and have no special reason why they can't wait for two weeks. There's nothing to be afraid of here, though if this bill becomes law, these people will be spared the humiliation of having to ask for permission and to pay to exercise their rights. Remember poll taxes? Getting rid of the self-defense tax would also be a good thing. Two, people who qualify for a license now, but because of imminent danger, can't afford to wait two weeks. The only fear that comes in here is for the safety of these people who um, they, they probably need to conceal carry so that the, the person they are in danger from doesn't see that they have a weapon. If this bill becomes law, these people will no longer face the dilemma of having to choose between obeying the law and defending their lives, a choice no one should ever have to make. Eliminating this dilemma would be a good thing. Then there are the third group is people who qualify for license now but are being denied because of police bias, and this has been addressed already. Um, the only ones afraid of these people are the police, and for no objective reason, which has also been stated. If this bill becomes law, these people will be spared the frustration of having their civil rights violated under color of law without due process. Eliminating this kind of discrimination would be a good thing. And the fourth group is people who do not qualify for a license. It's people in this group, I think, who are creating all the confusion. The main argument presented by opponents of this bill is that if it becomes law, these people will somehow be granted permission to carry a gun when they would not qualify for that permission now. Children will be taking their guns to school. Convicted felons will be carrying guns in Walmart. But that prospect, well, while scary, it's also false. People who are prohibited from carrying guns now will still be prohibited from carrying guns after this bill becomes law. They will, however, along with the people in the other three groups, be accorded the presumption of innocence. That is, the mere fact that someone is carrying a gun will no longer provide the police an excuse to demand proof of innocence in the form of a license. Rather, the burden of proof will be shifted to the state, which is where it belongs. 
presumption of innocence is a very, very good thing. It's fundamental to the idea of freedom. This bill would prevent the state from withholding it. So vote for SB 116 if you believe that, one, <coughs> the Constitution applies even when we're afraid. Two, people should not have to ask for permission or pay a fee to exercise a right. Three, in the presence of imminent threats to life and limb, a waiting period cannot be justified. Four, the violation of civil rights under color of law was, must not be sanctioned. And five, the presumption of innocence must be accorded to everyone, not just to people who don't scare you. Of course, if you disagree with any of these points, you should vote against the bill. And tell us which parts you disagree with so we can share that information with your constituents the next time you run for office. Seeing no questions, thank you very much. David Mullen. <coughs> My name is David Mullins. I'm from Nashua, New Hampshire, and I want to thank the committee for allowing me to speak here today. Uh, I'm speaking about uh, what I went through trying to get a concealed carry permit through the Nashua PD. Uh, in 2013, I applied and I was denied. And the denial was caused by a arrest 26 years ago, or 26 years prior. Now those charges were dropped 30 days later. So it was not a conviction. I was not prohibited from owning firearms. I've uh, bought other firearms here, and I've been through a Department of Defense uh, security clearance background check, and none of that had a problem. But the officer put in charge of there and thought that he should deny my right just because of an arrest. Uh, I currently have one because I've reapplied. Because uh, talking to Evan Knappen at a uh, local event, he said they should have never done that. I didn't know what the procedure was to appeal at the time. So he uh, said go ahead and reapply. But now on every application and every renewal I have to put on there that I've been denied and I have to explain why I was denied every time I renew now for something that should never have happened so I, I uh, uh, requested your support of this bill to stop people that are arbitrarily getting denied from exercising their right by, like I said, it was a delegate. It wasn't even the chief of police. And he thought that I should not own or be able to carry a firearm. Uh, I guess that's all I have for today. If there's any questions about the procedure. Would you be willing to tell us what the arrest was for? Why you uh, denied? Mm -hmm. My ex-girlfriend at the time, uh, she had gotten shot by uh, two associates that I knew that were at my house earlier that day and they tried to pull me in as conspiracy. Thank you, thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. Amy Moore. Good morning. My name is Amy Moore. I'm a Concord resident and a member of Moms Demand Action. I'm also the program manager for a large social services agency here in New Hampshire and have close to 400 employees throughout the state of New Hampshire who provide care in clients' homes. I'm here because this legislation is reckless and dangerous and it puts public safety at risk. In 46 states, including New Hampshire, a person must acquire a permit in order to carry a loaded concealed handgun in public. These permits ensure that certain core public safety standards are preserved when people are carrying hidden loaded guns in public places. This legislation would make New Hampshire one of only five, five states to abandon these standards by allowing loaded concealed public carry with no permit required. If this dangerous law becomes 
If this dangerous bill becomes law, dangerous people with violent histories will be allowed to carry New Hampshire for the first time. Under current law, concealed, public license, pub, concealed pistol licenses may only be issued to people not prohibited from having guns, including due to felony convictions, domestic abuse, or serious mental illness. And law enforcement can also stop someone with a recent violent conviction from carrying in public by denying a license to a dangerous person not suitable to carry here in Congress. By wiping out this license requirement, SB 116 would strip law enforcement of this authority to keep armed and dangerous people off the street. I, for one, have huge respect for the law enforcement officers throughout our state who put their lives on the line every day for our safety. I know I couldn't do it. These officers have, have voiced overwhelming opposition to this bill. The Attorney General's office has testified against this bill. This is common sense. I can tell you that the argument that SB 116 would keep women safer is not only wrong, it's ridiculous. This legislation would effectively dismantle New Hampshire's concealed carry permitting system, rolling back law enforcement's authority to stop dangerous people from carrying hidden and loaded guns throughout the state, including abusers who have had multiple domestic disturbances. The presence of a gun in a domestic violence situation increases the woman's risk of being killed by 500%. And you want to remove law enforcement's ability to block abusers from carrying concealed weapons. The gun lobby misleadingly calls this type of legislation constitutional carry but it has nothing to do with the Constitution and everything to do with public safety. I've heard many talk about the fact that this won't stop criminals. So if that's what we're thinking, we shouldn't have laws against rape or theft or domestic abuse. Is this what I'm hearing? Because that's what I've heard today. I urge you to stop this reckless and dangerous piece of legislation. Questions? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony today. Do violent criminals take out licenses? And how do you feel this, this law would affect that? No, but do they, do they stop first to ask if they can rape or abuse someone? Uh, oh, well, again, do violent criminals take out licenses? I don't know. I've actually never asked one, but I, I, would, I would ask you... <coughs> Is that the is that the argument against it? Is that because criminals won't follow something, we should never have laws against them? Representative Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. Yes. Um, Vermont is the sec uh, the first safest place in in the, in the United States, and the second safest place in the world next to Switzerland. Why do the police, if you know, or if you could explain, if you understand, you know, why, why do the Vermont State Police and the Vermont Chiefs of Police support constitutional carry? I actually don't know. What I do know is that the law enforcement and the Attorney General's office, as I said, oppose it in New Hampshire. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank, thank you very you. much. Susan Olson. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Susan Olson. I am the past chair and current director of legislation for the Women's Defense League of New Hampshire. We are a New Hampshire based firearm safety education and advocacy organization I appear before you here this morning in support of Senate Bill 116. would open by saying those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And what does this have to do with Senate Bill 116? As was the case with House Bill 582, opposition to Senate Bill 116 is based on ethnic, racial, and gender profiling. As I testified in February, New Hampshire's licensing requirement to discreetly carry a loaded firearm was enacted 92 years ago by New Hampshire Senate, quote, to control the possession, sale, 
and use of pistols or revolvers with specific reference to unnaturalized foreign born persons. <clears throat> New Hampshire's 1923 law was fathered by the Sullivan Act, named for famous and notoriously corrupt senator and mobster Timothy Sullivan of New York. It was passed in 1911 to make the ownership of revolvers by newly immigrated Italians and anyone else whose looks they did not like dependent solely upon the personal opinion and subjective judgment of local law enforcement. Profiling them even then, and I put the editorial on your tables, the New York Times declared that, quote, low-browed foreigners were rushing to purchase revolvers before the law and the ban came into effect two days later. In fact, the first person convicted under the law was an Italian immigrant named Mario Rossi, he was traveling to a job interview carrying a revolver for self-protection. The judge, after Mr. Rossi was found guilty of violating the law, declared, it is unfortunate that this is the custom with you and your kind, and that fact combined with your irascible nature furnishes much of the criminal business in this country. Now, not long after the passage of the Sullivan Act in New York, the Uniform Law Commission also known as the National Conference of Commissioners, which was established in 1892, revised and refined the Sullivan Act into a gun control template that was eventually adopted by states across the country and which, in effect, legalized discrimination against anyone found unsuitable. You may dress it up any way you choose to feel better, but profiling is an ugly word and an even uglier practice. However, according to the Association of New Hampshire Chiefs of Police and Granite State Progress, profiling now serves as the gold standard for the subjective determination of who is and is not a criminal. Ironically, it was not until the Hooks at Chief of Police was sued in 2013 that an actual definition of the 92-year-old term was found not to be enshrined in statute. In May 2014's Doyon versus Hooksit ruling, it appears that the court scrambled to construct a reason the chief would not be held liable for what looked and smelled like personal bias, ordering that a citizen could not rely on officially printed and published Department of Safety documents, and I'm talking about the pistol license. Specifically, until July of 2014, the only definition of suitable was found on page two of the then current pistol revolver license, you have a copy of that, quote, an applicant not prohibited under federal or New Hampshire law in possession of a firearm shall be deemed suitable. That definition disappeared into some legal black hole at the Department of Safety following the court's order, allowing the chiefs and granted state progress to capriciously and arbitrarily use profiling to decide who may and may not be deemed sufficiently <coughs> suitable. Like House Bill 582, Senate Bill 116 removes the subjectivity and ambiguity by replacing the pejorative term suitable with a crystal clear and unambiguous definition. And with Senator Bradley's amendment this morning, it clears up the issue as to whether or not federal law would be considered in that definition. No more making decisions based on somebody's brow or other ethnic or racial characteristic. And to mimic a famous television comedy, no more soup Nazis saying, no license for you. The Women's Defense League believes that making the license optional allows women who, in the face of stalking or other abusive behaviors, would otherwise have to cower behind closed doors and drawn draperies for up to 14 days waiting on law enforcement to arbitrarily and capriciously decide whether she is suitable to be allowed to discreetly defend herself outside of her home. No more, why do you need this little lady? No more, let the men take care of this. I will close once more with a statement from Democrat Attorney General Eric Holt profiling by law enforcement is not only wrong, 
It is profoundly misguided and ineffective because it wastes precious resources and undermines the public trust. Profiling or public trust doesn't seem a difficult choice. On behalf of the Women's Defense League of New Hampshire, I urge you to adopt the amendment proposed by Senator Bradley and vote ought to pass on Senate Bill 116. Seeing no questions, thank you very much. Ella Turgeon. Hello, thank you for allowing me to testify. My name is Eva Castillo Turgeon, but oh, that's okay, I've been called once. Uh, I live in Manchester and I am a volunteer with Moms Demand Action. Uh, this bill has really nothing to do with Second Amendment and everything to do with the safety of our communities. I'm here in opposition to talk, to speak on, in opposition to this bill. I don't think we should do away with the regulations to acquire permits. We're not speaking against Second Amendment rights. I am all for the right to carry. But we need regulations like everything. For God's sake, if we need a license to cut hair and apply fake fingernails, you know, I, last I heard nobody had died of a bad haircut. Why are we gonna do away with licensing okay, concealed guns? I have the right to live in a safe environment. My police officers have the right to work and be provided with a safe uh, environment where they can do their job in peace to the best of their ability. This is going to undermine the, their ability to check whether a suspect has a permit to carry a gun. This is going to put them in jeopardy. This is going to put me and my family and my children and my community in peril. We're not speaking against people carrying the guns. We just want stricter gun controls and safety measures to make sure that they do not land in the wrong hands. I have three 20 year old sons or in their 20s. One of them is absolutely nuts. When he goes crazy, he flies off the handle. I hide all my knives. I cannot imagine because I don't know when he's going to react. That guy should never be anywhere near a gun. And like him, there's plenty of people that do not have to have access to guns. So I really urge you to consider not voting in favor of this. In other words, vote no. This is a totally nonsense uh, law that we really do not need. Thank you very much. No questions. Thank you very much. Alan Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I have some uh, <clears throat> copies of my prepared testimony. Thank you to the clerk. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, representatives. For the record, my name is Alan Rice, and I appear before you today as a member of the Board of Directors of the New Hampshire Firearms Coalition. We're an organization representing law-abiding firearms owners, dealers, and manufacturers. And we strongly support Senate Bill 116 and urge you to vote it ought to pass. I'm also here today on behalf of our partners at Gun Owners of America, a national organization which represents hundreds of thousands of law-abiding firearms owners. Gun Owners of America also strongly supports Senate Bill 116. As you know, we've, we've had a concealed carry law in New Hampshire since 1923. We're in our 92nd year of licensed concealed carry. As others have said, our western neighbor, Vermont, has never required a license or permission to carry a concealed self-defense firearm. Neither state requires a license to carry a firearm openly or unconcealed. However, an important distinction that 
others have left out when they spoke this morning about you can carry openly without a license. The license in New Hampshire is also required for loaded in a vehicle. So yes, you can carry openly without a license, but as soon as you get in your car, if you do not have the license, you have to unload your firearm. If you get out of your car, same thing, you'd have to load it to carry it in public. Um, I can tell you as a firearms instructor, the repeated loading and unloading of a firearm in a concealed place like a car could cause an unintended discharge. It's always safer on your person in your holster unless it's needed for immediate self-defense. The law that's being proposed in Senate Bill 116 simply does away with the requirement for a license. It doesn't say you can carry a gun and go hurt people, rob stores, assault people. It's just the mere act of carrying a firearm without a license would not be a crime. We've seen a lot of cases of the so-called issuing authorities abusing their authority and denying licenses to people who are in fact legally allowed to own and use firearms. The gentleman from Nashua spoke of that earlier in a first-hand description. And people who have gone through that are far more qualified than I am to discuss it. But we believe if you're not a convicted felon, you should have a right to carry concealed. When people are denied that right, they have to go to court. Usually it involves hiring an attorney. It's costly and slow, and that, I don't believe, is what the legislature intended in 1923. Uh, it was talked earlier that the Department of Safety last year changed the application form, and they did change it in response to the court case. But it used to be pretty clear on the back of the form, if you're not prohibited by law from owning a firearm, you can carry it. <coughs> Currently, the New Hampshire pistol revolver license is valid in 22 under other states under reciprocity provisions and we support that and that's why we support Senate Bill 116 because it leaves the license as an option for those people who travel. The police in New Hampshire do an excellent job. I, I believe they're better than the police in most states. But they don't have a duty to provide protection services to average citizens and if a person is injured you cannot sue the police for failure to provide protection services. If they don't come fast enough when you call 911, you can't sue the police. Armed self-defense by law-abiding people has been proven to work. Someone spoke earlier about active shooters and criminals approaching people, and I believe Representative Manjipudi, did I pronounce it correctly, um, spoke about carrying openly. Well, concealed, the criminals, the evildoers in society don't know who is able to respond and protect themselves from a criminal attack. Um, I'm old enough to remember the days when telephones did not have caller ID. So you didn't know who was calling when your phone rang. And oftentimes, single women would get obscene phone calls. That's a rarity now with the caller ID, because everybody has it at home, on their cell phones. You know who's calling, so you can do bad things on the phone, but you're going to divulge your identity. Concealed carry is the same thing. The criminals don't know who is able to fend off a violent attack and who's not. In July of 2014, a doctor prevented a mass shooting at a hospital in Darby, Pennsylvania, when he used his concealed firearm <coughs> to stop a gunman. The gunman ignored the hospital's gun-free zone. Police said that had it not been for the armed doctor, the perpetrator would have gone out in the hallway and just walked down the offices until he ran out of ammunition. This past New Year's Eve in Osceola County, Florida, a pastor prevented a possible mass shooting at his church, <clears throat> saved the lives of several men, women, and children when he used his firearm to stop a shooter. We at the New Hampshire Firearms Coalition, along with our colleagues at Gun Owners of America, Trust our fellow citizens to follow the law and behave responsibly. If someone does commit a crime while carrying a concealed firearm, there are many statutes which provide for the prosecution and if convicted incarceration of those individuals. We do not in any way object to those, those laws. 
However, repealing the license is time has come. We've had a 92 year experiment with licensed concealed carry and unfortunately the last, I'd say 10 years, we've seen the problems really pop up. And I would just want to add, and it's not in the testimony I submitted, um, we do, we had a chance to look at Senator Bradley's amendment and we do support that. Um, I, I have, what I gave you says, I'm asking you to pass it without amendment and I, I want to change that to say we support Senator Bradley's amendment and we'd like to see Senate Bill 116 passed with what Senator Bradley proposed this morning. I thank you for your time, your consideration, and your public service and I will happily entertain any questions that the members may have. Representative Barnes. I have two questions, Mr. Chairman. First of all, are you responsible for crafting that form letter of which I got about 300 copies? I have to see the letter, but we do send out a lot of form letters, yes, sir. Uh, do you understand that brevity in many times wins the day? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just want to correct your uh, the collection. I was not the one who talked about the open carry bill. It was uh, Representative Pendelakis. I, I apologize. Yeah. I'm sorry. So I just I want to make one record. Things down quickly. I apologize. <laughs> but at least you got your name right. <laughs> <laughs> With all due respect, I do not. I'm one of those people that I openly say I do not believe in self-protection with a gun. I, I'm a peace-loving, you know, person and my constituents who believe in that and public safety, I would leave it to the law enforcement and our government. I assume you meant that as a question. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, <coughs> thank you for taking my question. Uh, I keep hearing that, uh, you know, we look at the Constitution, the state of Hampshire, the state that uh, you're allowed to say thank you. Uh, why was this of a challenge within the state Supreme Court if it is a violation that they're not, usually that is the process that we use in this great state of ours, country, if you disagree with something, but you believe, why was the challenge? Well, sir, actually, what's been challenged is the denials of people who are not prohibited by law from owning firearms. And the court has made what I refer to as judge-made law. And they have decided that a person who is lawfully allowed to own a gun may not necessarily qualify to carry that gun concealed. And that's why we're seeking Senate Bill 116 as a remedy to the judge-made law. Hey, for instance, at the if, for instance, that uh, you know it was challenged in, would you believe, in uh, the Hampshire Supreme Court, you still have a right to go to the United States Supreme Court, wouldn't you? Would you believe? I'm not an attorney, so I don't know if you can appeal state laws to federal courts. <clears throat> but my preference, and I believe we get a fairer hearing and a fairer consideration from this body than from the state Supreme Court as it's currently comprised. Thank you for taking my question, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Seeing no further questions, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ed Cutler. Oh, here. Actually, I have a gift for the committee, which is a book on the gun laws of Vermont, so you can better understand. Thank you. You're welcome. I think Representative Burke has got the Vermont gun laws down path. <laughs> <laughs> well, the nice thing about this is this was actually written by one of the foremost firearms attorneys in the country. Actually, we, have, we are blessed by having her in Vermont. So... Um, my name's Ed Cutler. I'm here representing the Gun Owners of Vermont, your sister, your sister pro-gun organization across the river. Um, we are, I'm here in full support of this bill, and having read that amendment, we're here for the amendment too. 
Um, I'm here more to answer questions and explain to you how Vermont works because with all the talk about what's going on nationwide with pro-gun carry concealed and what we call Vermont carry, we are here to give you 220 years of nonviolent history with probably, because I'm saying probably because nobody knows for sure, we have no registration, the highest firearms ownership rate in the nation. Um, since Brady has been enacted, 627,000 people in the state of Vermont have purchased under the Brady check 557,000 firearms that's since 1968. Nobody in Vermont gets shot accidentally. Um, our average murder <coughs> rate over the past 20 years is two per year. We don't have shootouts. We don't have problems. Matter of fact, I supplied for the committee this year, which shows the FBI crime statistics, which are the only real statistics in existence. We also have some local Vermont statistics that equal it out. Throughout the course of this day, you're going to hear arguments from both sides, and I guess uh, the most important thing is credibility. On the second page, you will notice a press release from uh, Bobby Richards of Crossfire Arms, who is presently suing, or within the next two, two weeks to a month, will be suing Michael Bloomberg and Mom's Demand Action for um, basically trying to ruin his business and uh, telling lies nationally about not only his business, but also defaming the whole state of Vermont. It's going to be a very interesting case. Um, as of Thursday, um, our local organization, um, Gun Sense Vermont, uh, made a huge mistake when their $200,000 lobbyist came out and said, we can't approve the uh, language of the bill you're presently looking at because we have to name check with our national people. This is supposed to be a grassroots in state organization. The gun owners of Vermont have always been honest with our legislators and I'll be here being honest with you, answering your questions directly. Um, I was going to do the PBS salt poll, but I guess somebody else brought that up. Yes, uh, Mr. Cutler, is it not true that you've got some gun bills in the Vermont State House of the present time? Uh, presently, yes, uh, we have S-141, which will be voted down tomorrow, guaranteed. <laughs> Just to refresh my memory, what, what is that bill? I read it, okay. but I can't recall it. Um, right now, it's got four parts. The first part is turning over the mental records of somebody who is deemed a danger to themselves or others. There are a hundred and, no, excuse me, 240 people on that system. 99.9% .9 of those people that are dangerous to themselves and others are anorexic, diabetics refuse, that refuse to take insulin. We haven't had a sick individual do anything bad in the state of Vermont for the uh, last 20 years. Before that, we only had one. We feel that that bill is not needed. We don't want to ostracize our sick people. The second part is uh, going to make it illegal for a violent felon to possess a firearm, which right now is legal in the state of Vermont. And again, the anti-gun organization is pushing for that bill because they don't think they ought to have uh, an okay to do that and the feds are not enforcing the law. During testimony in the Judiciary Committee, the feds said, yes, we're going after hardened criminals. What we're leaving alone is the guy on medical marijuana, whether you agree with it or not, or a 30-year-old conviction for something stupid. So the feds really do go after the hardened criminals, at least in the state of Vermont. I don't know what they do here. 
Uh, the third part is uh, going to be state help with implementing the uh, New Hampshire gun shop project, which you guys are come up with it. It's I saw that and I fell in love. Whether the bill passes or not, the gun owners of Vermont, the Vermont Federation of Sportsmen's Clubs, and other pro-gun groups in state will be implementing that without state help. We have the funding in place. We have psychiatrists willing and able to help these people for free. So, um, it's a great system in Vermont. Um, nobody is disbarred to use the firearms. There are no age limitations, except if you're 16 or under, you need your parents' permission to shoot or go out. Um, nobody is not allowed to carry virtually anywhere except in a courthouse or a prison. Uh, we've got the greatest system in the world. We've got, a, like I said, 200-year history. Um, the beauty of concealed carry without a permit is, again, nobody has any idea who's carrying, so who do they target first in a bad situation. The reason I'm over here is because many times the citizens of Vermont sh shop in New Hampshire. Uh, <laughs> we, hey, beautiful tax-free New Hampshire, we appreciate it. Uh, so a lot of times we'll come across the river, there'll be a gun in the glove compartment on somebody's pocket, whatever. I personally have a pistol permit for New Hampshire, so I don't have to worry about it. But everybody in Vermont has some kind of a firearm. And lots of them come across the river without that permit. I'm here to protect my people as well as make your people a safer, uh, your state a safer place. Thank you, Mr. Cutler, for coming. Uh, could you tell me the population of Vermont? Uh, roughly 625,000. Thank you. Representative Burke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for. Uh, the trip over here from Vermont. I have two questions, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Uh, could you explain uh, what is going on in Vermont with moms demand action and gun sets? Because okay. I've been reading a few articles. Yeah, actually, uh, it's, it's, it's the most complicated, crazy thing I've ever seen in my whole life. Two years ago, um, there, a group was started in Vermont that's supposed to be a local grassroots group. Its name of it is uh, Gun Sense Vermont. The first thing they did was start going around the state looking to overturn or get firearms law in the state even though we don't need it. They started in Burlington and we have a, a state law that says a town or village cannot regulate firearms. It has to be done on the state level. They spent First year of existence, they spent roughly seven sixty thousand dollars in Burlington trying to get a vote passed to go to the legislature to get actually permission to be in violation of state law. So, okay, what they did was they wanted a ban on magazines, assault weapons. Um, they wanted pistol permits, which has already been overturned by the Vermont Supreme Court. Um, you can't have a firearm on any property owned or controlled by a liquor license, which is the parking lot in the Radisson Hotel, because they have a bar in the building. Um, and a couple others, I tell you the truth, it's over and done with, with that one. And that bill failed, so I haven't been paying attention. Next thing we know, they're in the legislature this year. Um, they got a few senators to introduce a bill. Um, they hired the top lobbying firm in the state, and as of now, they've spent roughly $200,000. Now, this is a grassroots organization that's only been in business for two years. Our group's been there 20 years, and we've never seen that kind of money. <laughs> I'm basically the person that does all the lobbying up there, and I'm not getting paid for it. So. We come to find out, and we're suspecting this all the time, but we come to find out that this <coughs> supposed grassroots organization is being funded by uh, Moms Demand Action. Mr. Chairman, the point of order, um, 
if I may. This is a public hearing on New Hampshire SB 116. With all due respect, okay. testimony. I don't see how uh, dragging other organizations, are we going to have 48 other representatives from other states here talking about everything that goes on in their states? I don't see how that is, 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 is relevant to this bill at this time. And I, and I think you're right. And, and I, I apologize because I, I know you have a lot of good information, but I'm not sure this is the proper form. Sure. Whatever you guys would like. Right. Well, my next question is relevant if I have a follow-up. Right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And why it's relevant is I want to, I've asked this question to the Vermont, uh, to the New Hampshire State Police here, and I have had an answer, so I want to hear your answer. What is the difference between the Chief of the Police in Vermont and also the Vermont State Police? Why do they support it compared to the New Hampshire? Um, well, the, the, the I'm, best I can answer is the, uh, the Vermont State Police, the Sheriff's Association, and everything else is always have always backed us up. They know what it's like over there, um, and they can't actually, in testimony at in the uh, in the House, excuse me, in the Senate during the massive hearing, they were in full support of us asking them to actually drop the bill that we have. So. Okay. Thank you. Representative Cushing. I'll pass. Uh, Mr. Cutler, I think you have a Yorker problem in Vermont. We have a Massachusetts and Yorker problem. But we drove the Yorkers out 220 years ago. Now <laughs> 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 they're coming back and they can't seem to stop. I just have one question that has absolutely nothing to do with anything, but is Senator Sears still the chairman of the judiciary? Yes, he is, and he's a great guy and a good friend. Thank you very much. Is Bob Starr still here? Bobby Starr's still there. He's actually on our side. I'm a Vermonter, so. Okay. What? <laughs> yeah, I know. No family. Seeing no further questions. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And again, anybody has any questions, please. Happy to answer. Kevin Bloom. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Kevin Bloom. I'm here representing the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. I'll be very, very brief. I know it's, you've been here forever and it's hot, but um, we would like to support SB 116 <coughs> as amended. And I'm here actually because I got uh, calls about two incidents that happened a couple weeks ago. And I had a, an individual call and tell me that he had been denied um, a license to carry, although he's been a New Hampshire resident for over 20 years. Uh, has no criminal record, but he was disqualified for a moving violation in his car. And then he told me that his son had been denied a, a concealed carry license because he had been charged as a minor with a misdemeanor that was later dropped. So there's no conviction, just a charge. So those are only two incidents, but I've got a speeding ticket before and I don't think that I should be denied a concealed carry license because of that. And that's really all I have. Thank you very much. No questions. Thank you very much, sir. Sue Newman? She had to go put some coins uh, in the mirror. Oh, here she is. Sue. Timing is everything. You've been called. <laughs> what? Hi. This is my first time up here to testify, so I find you all an imposing group. I'm sure you're all kind people. I'm sure you are. I just want to say that the reading that I have done on the Senate bill, I'm in favor of keeping it as it is, that I think there should be a permit, a license, whatever you want to call it, process for somebody to be able to, con to carry a concealed weapon. I am aware that there, I'm sure, have been abuses in some capacity on some amount in the past or, or would occur still if there, if, there's, if there remains a license or a permit. But I think it's minimal compared to the benefit of knowing that there's just a second set of eyes giving somebody the permission to carry a concealed weapon. Let me just say anecdotally, I, I really have, I've been to this building, uh, this second or third time I've been to this building. I've been in buildings in Washington, D.C. on numerous occasions, and for me to come up here from Nashua and to come into the building, just walk right in, 
no security check or anything. I find it a little off-putting. I, I commented to the security officer when I was on my way down because I went through a wrong set of doorways or whatever. And I looked at I said, I want to get out, I want to get back here. I asked him, are you armed? He said, no. And he said, are you? And I said, no. And I said, but I guess everybody else I have to assume is, I find this frightening. And, and as a grandmother who's got a four-year-old grandson having a birthday in New Hampshire today, I hear all these platitudes, Vermont's a great place, blah, blah, blah. A lot of places are great places, but I will honestly say, when I am in the city of Washington, D.C., which has outrageous crime statistics, I tend to feel safer there because I know we're all kind of looking out for each other. And up here, I think many people are looking out for each other, but I got to tell you, when I have to look, and out of all of you, maybe a third could be carrying a weapon, and you're walking around on the street or in the grocery store, as a parent, as somebody who's lived in New Hampshire since 1981, I question the direction you're going. I have a son-in-law who's a police officer in Florida. He believes in the law. We all believe in the Constitution. But just to give the police just a little extra something so that they know when there is a household who may or may not have guns, but there is a at least a not even a reported history and I'm trying to be careful with my words because I know of the situation there are firearms in the household there's also it might not be reported domestic violence but there's been a couple police calls to the house because things got out of hand in my opinion they own their firearms okay but I don't want to see that person have a concealed carry permit and if the police are aware of that, maybe maybe it would send a message. You know, keep, try and keep your guns safe. Um, and and I know everybody's got a constitutional right in Second Amendment. We have rights too. So please look out for the rest of us. And I have to say, maybe more of us could adopt Representative Manjapudi's. Let's try to live peacefully with each, with each other. We don't have to agree, but we can get along. The last thing I will say is, I guess to, to bring this home and to end it up, I'm used to rambling more at school board meetings, so I apologize. In 2010, I was in Washington at the uh, John Stewart and Stephen Colbert rally for sanity, okay, along with about a million other people, I believe. But at the end of it, he said, the bottom line seems to be, and Washington uh, is, a, is a good place for it, a tunnel. You're going through a tunnel and there's six lanes of traffic. Everybody's trying to get through. The only way we can all get through, you go, then you go, then I go, and then we start again. And the traffic will move. If we are continually butting heads with each other over everything, nobody's gonna go anywhere. So I would ask for a little, um, I guess, a little thoughtfulness when you decide this bill and the permitting licensing process as it stands now, in my opinion, seems to be a reasonable thing, something for public safety, something for the common good. Thank you. Thank you. Is, uh, Jay out here? Jay out? Oh. Why are we getting to the end? We were just here. No, we're not getting to the end. Oh, he told me to text him when we get toward the end. Oh, all right. That might be a shot. <coughs> yeah. yeah. Mr. Schmidt. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, Mr. Schmidt. Well, it'd be Jan, that'd be me. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, and uh, honored friends who will run this committee as well. First, let me say that New Hampshire is not Vermont. It is so not Vermont, if you look at the map, you'll see that we are exactly opposite. We can't go by Vermont's rules. We have to go by New Hampshire's rules. And what we've got in place now is working for New Hampshire. And all of the places that I went online this week to see how we were doing were anywhere uh, between first and safest and sixth, which is pretty darn good. If it's good, why do we need to change it? It makes no sense to me. 
also, there were people who were giving you ideas about what the polls were saying. Uh, I have to tell you, as a person who uses a computer quite well, I can hack almost any poll, and I can change their numbers. So you can't use that as, as a guide for how people feel. And besides, this isn't about I. The, the bills you, you receive are never about I. They're about we. They're about bills for all of us. Not just people who love their guns, not just people who hate guns, not for people like me who don't bother with guns. This, this is really, this is really about we. Um, if you look at the statistics further, if you look beyond the United States, you'll see that New Hampshire, even it's at a great, great country, we do poorly across the, across the globe. We do so poorly. Um, we're in the same area as, as Mexico ruled by gangs and drug lords, that is no place for us to be. We should be doing better. And we could. We could easily do better. And we don't have to infringe on people's rights. We don't have to. <coughs> because the New Hampshire Constitution gave us the right. If you look at Article 3, my personal favorite, Article 3 says, when men enter into a state of society, they surrender some of their natural rights to that society in order to ensure the protection of others. This is about all of us. This is about people like you, people like me, all of us. And so making rules that manage things that are difficult for all of us is really our goal. That's all I really wanted to say. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Would you believe that I was hoping this would pass beca because following Vermont's example, because then I could testify that we ought to have an income tax? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would. Wouldn't that be interesting? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no sales tax, please. Kimberly yeah, Mara, so, so <laughs> we need the money. Yeah, no. So now the families are stealing it from us. Hello. Oh, what? Red Fall isn't here to hear this? Come on. <laughs> uh, my name is Kimberly Warren. I am uh, Vice President of the Women's Defense League of New Hampshire. And I am testifying today for myself. Um, first, based on some of the things that we've heard earlier, a firearm is an inanimate object. It does not become a weapon until it is used as such. You call your hands and fist weapons. The number one weapon used to abuse and kill women is hands and fists. Knives and guns are actually last on the list. <laughs> as far as open carry goes, you have people like Moms Demand calling 911 on those who are open carrying in public, in Walmarts, in Targets. So it really doesn't make sense to have us force us to only open carry because we're going to get the cops called on us and it's going to be like a swatting event where they're lying and saying that we're performing some kind of dangerous whipping around our gun just because they don't like firearms. I can send you the news stories about this already happening. Do you really want women to turn women into targets for men who see they are open carrying on top of that? Also, domestic abusers aren't allowed to purchase firearms, but suddenly they're, some, they're gonna be able to if constitutional carry is passed? That's ab obviously absurd. So, once again, I sit before you to ask you to restore women's rights. In 1920, when women first gained the right to vote, they already had the right to protect themselves however they saw fit. Up until 1923, of course, when a discriminatory Tory law was passed. It's almost embarrassing that there is even a question of whether or not any legislator should restore women's rights. We recently had men in the Senate claim that birth control is a right. So as a woman, I decided to look it up in the Constitution I didn't see birth control lifted as one of my rights, but I did see protection as one of my rights. Of course, these are the same men in the Senate who don't believe that women have the right to protect themselves, or that women, such as myself, fighting for our rights, are actually fighting for women's rights issues. Some of these same men in the Senate 
also voted to update 100-year-old banking laws. Interesting <coughs> that certain senators are okay with updating laws for bankers, but not updating 90-year-old laws for women, isn't it? Millions of women have decided they are refusing to be victims. We realize we're our own first lines of defense. And that's not saying 911 dispatch and the police don't do an excellent job. They do. But a piece of paper or a phone call to call the guys with guns doesn't make a difference when they, when they are minutes away <coughs> and seconds matter. Are you really going to be the legislature that tells women who have fled their abuser or are terrified of their stalker that they can't protect themselves in public until the chief of the police decides they are worthy? Lauren? Yes. Could you make uh, comments pertaining to the bill? I mean, you're talking These about are all pertaining to the bill. You're talking about issues that are not, have nothing to do with the, the bill. I'm explaining to you why if you don't pass this bill, you're hurting women. What don't you understand about that? Oh. Wow. I'm, no, I'm asking you. What, what is it that isn't pertaining to the bill? To tell me and I'll, I'll leave that out if that's what you're saying. Well, the whole thing is that we've been debating this for, for two hours now. Mm -hmm. And you're... Yeah, you I said as long as I need. Well, <laughs> I got you on that one. more, you did. But in all honesty, there's a whole lot of people here that have. I didn't think I'd actually been speaking that long, but you said I, I can try to speed it up a little, if and you, can, you know. That would be helpful. But um, what is it that I'm not talking about that is, spe is specific to the bill? Maybe you can answer me that. Well, why don't you continue to make your point about women? I agree that women in, in a different situation. Have to wait 14 days. Right, right, yeah, and that's that's the point that I'm getting to. But I had to make comments about some other stuff that weren't realistic. So that's I'll continue. So are, are you really going? To, uh, some some women are already being victimized by abusers or stalkers. If they decide they want the right to protect themselves by denying them their lawful right under the Constitution, you are victimizing them once again. Can you honestly live with yourselves knowing that may be the case? Many of you claim to be proponents of abused women. You support domestic violence laws, support increases in the budget to help women in domestic violence situation. How can you possibly claim to support these women if you refuse to support their right to protect themselves how they see fit? Their abusers don't obey your laws, so these women are stuck, unable to protect themselves because of your decisions, or decisions made 90 years ago with laws that are draconian, oppressive, and outdated. How many times do we hear about women who flee their abusers getting killed within a few days of them leaving, even though they have that restraining order? Even though they may hide and go to a safe place? These women know, and statistics prove, that these women are likely to get killed within the first few days of leaving their abuser. They shouldn't <coughs> and they can't afford to wait 14 days while a chief of police decides whether or not they are suitable to that person. This is why it's so terrifying for a woman to finally leave her abuser. She is going out there into the world unprotected. She has a piece of paper, she might have a safe house, but she doesn't have a cop next to her side 24 seven to protect her. She doesn't have the guy with a gun to stop her abuser from killing her. But she could be her own self protector and rescue herself with a firearm as opposed to waiting for someone else on a phone to come with a gun. Usually by then it's too late. Again, if legislators in the Senate can, can agree in a bipartisan fashion to update 100-year-old laws for bankers, don't you think it's time you all agree to update 90-year-old laws and restore women's rights? Please <coughs> vote ought to pass on SB 116. Women across the state, especially in rural areas where the cops are even further away than they'd like, they are counting on you. Thank you very much. For the members of the committee who have a, a need to eat something, 
We're not going to go as a committee. We can go one at a time and then come we're back. We're not going to recess. No, we, we've got to. The town grows as I hold it. So I think that if, if some of you who have that snoring in your I wouldn't want to miss the action. <laughs> <laughs> could, could you rule that they can't repeat what has already been given as testimony? I could, but they have a right to speak. I know. And we have a right to listen. No, with that. Harrison Debris. <coughs> My name is Harrison Debris. Um, I live in Dover, and I'm representing myself today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the committee, for hearing me talk. Um, while it wasn't mentioned here today, it was mentioned at the previous hearing on a different bill, HB 582, and on this bill in the Senate. There was a complaint that this bill would allow children under the age of 18 to carry concealed uh, in New Hampshire. Well, if that were true, they could do that currently right now because we have zero laws on open carry. Um, last I checked, <coughs> I haven't seen any 12-year-olds open carrying in Manchester or anywhere else for that matter. Um, the reason for this is because we have New Hampshire law preventing the transfer of firearms to minors. That is RSA 159.12. There are a few exceptions, and in my testimony there, I included that law for you to look at, as well as the federal law, 18 U.S.C. 922 Section X, bars possession of a handgun by minors. There are, of course, again, exceptions, but this is typically limited to things like ranchers giving a handgun to their son for use on the ranch. Um, so anyone saying that this bill allows children to carry guns is really a scare monger. It's already against the law for them to possess, except in very specific circumstances. <coughs> um, another thing that wasn't mentioned by the gentleman from Vermont is that some Vermont residents are not able to carry concealed in New Hampshire because the state police refuses to issue them the license unless they have permission from their police chief. Some police chiefs will not give that permission. Um, this bill would fix that by allowing them to carry concealed in New Hampshire just like they can in Vermont without a license. Um, I did have a chance to look at the amendment. I don't, I don't say it in my testimony, but I do not have any uh, reason for not passing that amendment. So uh, I ask you to pass the bill and uh, the amendment. <coughs> Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Okay. Roy Sarge. Okay. No I'll make this pretty brief because, frankly, we've heard most of it anyway, so there's no real point. Um, my name is Roy Sargent, I'm a lifelong resident. I'm actually the fourth generation of my family to call the Grand Estate my home. This really isn't a complex issue. We already have uh, open carry without a license. This is really no different. All we're doing is saying that you don't now have to pay a tax to exercise a constitutional right. And frankly, that's in essence what the license is. We don't have training requirements or anything like that. So all this does is garner revenue for the state. Criminals aren't going to be applying anyway. So it's really not doing much of anything. Um, as far as violence goes, we know from Vermont that it's not going to turn us into the Wild West. It's just simply not going to. It's a very simple process. Um, that's pretty much it in all reality. Um, we just know it's not going to do anything bad. It's, this is just one step to kind of move forward and make it so towns can't take the law into their own hands. We've had chiefs of police coming out and denying people permits based on personal feelings. We have towns that are taking way longer than their, their allotted time to actually issue permits. And from personal experience, I had to have an attorney go after the town of Auburn because they chose to post the names of everyone who got a permit in their town minutes. It, it doesn't matter when you tell them something's not, not allowed. They choose to do it anyway, and they choose to disregard the law because they feel that they're above it. This would eliminate that. So, thank you very much.
Seeing no questions, thank you very much. Gerald Perry. Thank you. I believe I put three minutes. I'll try to be more brief <coughs> than that. There was one of the speakers just a few speakers ago that mentioned Part 1, Article 3 of the New Hampshire Constitution. And she read part of Part 1, Article 3 that says that when men enter into a society, they surrender rights in exchange for protection. She left off the end of Part 1, Article 3 that says, absent the protection, the surrender of rights <coughs> is void. And there have been numerous federal court cases. The one has gone all the way to the US Supreme Court that says that there is no obligation of police to protect anyone, which in my interpretation of words either mean what they say or they don't mean what they say, it means to me that I have not surrendered any rights because absent protection, the surrender of rights is void. There have been a lot of people talking about rights, that they have a right to know who has a firearm. They have a right to know who has a weapon. There are many things that could be used as weapons. This chair could be used as a weapon if I wanted it to be used as such. There are no laws about uh, knife ownership, possession of knives, open carry, concealed carry, internal carry if you chose to do that. For some weird reason, there are no regulations about carrying weapons except for firearms. And there have been claims that this would allow criminals and rapists and murderers to carry firearms without being in violation of the law. And that's not what this bill says at all. On line 11 in part, it says, unless the applicant is prohibited from owning and possessing a firearm. On page two, line seven, the individual is not otherwise prohibited from possessing a firearm. So this would not allow rapists and murderers and white beaters to carry concealed handguns. This would still make that illegal because rapists and murderers are not allowed currently under statute to possess firearms, let alone carry them concealed or openly. Uh, there has been a question about why not just require everybody to open carry and there are reasons that people choose not to open carry. There are reasons people choose to carry concealed. In Florida, they actually have a law that says that if you have a permit to carry, you must carry concealed. If your jacket gets blown open by the wind and the firearm is exposed, you are committing a crime. You can get arrested for doing that. Uh, there was a question about beauticians having licenses of why do beauticians have to have licenses, but people that want to conceal carry a gun don't need one? Well, I don't think beauticians should have to have a permit or a license to do their job. And there's also the question about uh, why do you feel the need to carry a weapon uh, when there's police that can defend you? Well, why do you feel the need to own a fire extinguisher when there's the fire department to protect you if your house catches fire? And with that, I'll answer any questions. No questions. Thank you very much. David Love. <coughs> I'm Dave Love from Derry. Thank you, the committee, for hearing my testimony. Um, I've testified before on, uh, on similar bills here, and uh, you know, to me, it's uh, it, it's not only the words uh, that we're talking about here; it's the punctuation. You know, uh, in the in the Second Amendment, there's that little dot after the word infringed. Your ten dollar fee is an infringement upon me. You're writing down three people that I have to use as ref have references, uh, have for references, is an infringement upon me. Your 14-day waiting time is an infringement on me. In fact, I, I know that if I went to the state police right now, up to the, their uh, the uh, background check window, if I put up the, the money, uh, I've been there. It's, a, it's about a 10-minute wait. Okay, uh, you know, 14 days is is absurd. Okay, uh, it's uh, it's an infringement. Um, you know, you've, you've heard about uh, you know, the words mean what, the, what they say or don't they? Uh, we're either a, a society of laws or we're a lawless society. 
If we're going to infringe upon the Constitution and the rights given to us, and, and that's okay by you guys in the courts, we're a lawless society. If, if we can twist a word to mean what it doesn't mean, we're a lawless society. And that's what's happened here over time. Ninety years ago, the, the state of New Hampshire made a grievous constitutional mistake. They had no right to do that. You know, you've heard, you've heard about all the, the uh, profiling and stuff like that that went along with it. And, uh, you know, today, um, you know, you don't have the right to take away my Second Amendment rights. Plain and simple. You know, we've, we've got, uh, arguably, arguably uh, a lot of people would argue this point that, uh, you know, we've got a, a tyrannical government in place. And that's what the Second Amendment's all about. You know, Thomas Jefferson said the purpose of the Second Amendment as, is as a last resort to pre prevent prevent tyranny, okay? Uh, who is anybody in here to take away that right? Your fears, anybody's fears here, do not trump the, the Constitution. I have a friend that's a member of this body, and he said when he's considering legislation, the first thing he thinks about is the Constitution. I beg to ask you, you know, is the, is the current law we have constitutional? You know, if our founding fathers wanted anything, anything to infringe upon our, our rights, they would have put a comma after infringe, and unless or except, something along those lines. It's not there. But I, I, I think they knew far better than anyone in this room what they were writing. And, you know, one of my, one of my, my, my beefs here is, uh, is the, the, uh, the backdoor registration is with this, uh, what our, our current law has. Uh, the, the state police, the local police, they all know who owns guns. You know, I, I, I testified before that I was, I'm from Derry, and I was stopped, up the, up, I was broke down, up north of the notches. I had my hood up, my head underneath the hood of my truck, and uh, I had a state police officer at my shoulder. Didn't even hear him come up. And, uh, you know, the, he didn't ask me if I needed a tow truck, or if I needed a wrench or somebody, you know, somebody to hold something out of my way or anything. He asked me, do you have any weapons? You know? And uh, one of the gentlemen over here asked if I had an NRA sticker, and uh, I went and I researched that. And, uh, you know, I don't join the NRA just because I joined the, you know, because I wanted to join the NRA. I've joined the NRA and, and let my, my membership lapse because I didn't quite agree with everything they were doing. <coughs> and at the time I owned this vehicle, see, I, I sold it in 2005, okay? For three, four, five years in, in, before that point, uh, I wasn't a member of the NRA. I was against something that they were, they were standing for. And, uh, you know, so I didn't have a, a sticker on my, on my truck at the time, you know? I, uh, I, I believe wholeheartedly, you know, that what we have today is a backdoor registration. I don't need to tell, tell any of you what's happened throughout history with, it, with registration, you know? You know, Adolf Hitler and Mao Zedong, you know, uh, Fidel Castro, uh, you know, right down the line, you know, Joe Stalin, uh, you know, they've all capitalized on, on gun registration, you know? It's always led to confiscation, <coughs> it's always led to genocide, you know? And, uh, you know, if you're going to stand up, stand up and, uh, and take an oath to uphold the Constitution, you cannot in good conscience, you know, vote <coughs> against this law. Thank you. Yeah, uh, sir, we do, um, what's it, Mr. Lane? Well, um, would Do you think it's an infringement on your rights to get a license for reciprocity in other states? That's my, that would be my business. Okay. Um, as far as requiring, wholeheartedly, unequivocally requiring me to have a, 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 a permit, is, as far as I can read, you know, I learned this in the third and fourth grade, that that dot meant the end of statement. You know, plain and simple. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for your testimony. Do you believe that the Constitution, as written several hundred years ago, is absolute and should never be changed? No, we have a, a, a vehicle in place to amend it, okay? And unless we're going to talk about amending it, we've got to go with what we've got. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Robert Quay. Mr. Chairman, how many do we have left? Just so I could text JR. Because uh, he's in a hearing. And we have eight left. Eight left? Eight Thank left. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm sorry I haven't been able to sit here and listen to all the testimony, but I was in another bill on taxes. He's going now. Uh, my name is, this is a lot easier. This is a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Robert Clay. I'm uh, 
former member of this, this body, and I'm also the president of Program New Hampshire. And I'm in support of the bill, and I'm also in support of the amendment as given to you today by uh, uh, Senator Bradley. Uh, I know that when you heard the House version of the same bill, uh, someone read my testimony, and since it's already part of the record, and I couldn't possibly read it as well as Kimberly Morin did, I'll, I'll give you some other instances. Uh, one of the big reasons why I have a problem with, with the carry permit is that I have to carry for my job. I am one of those people, someone asked today, when was the last time a gun was pulled on you? Um, one of my companies owns a lot of communications towers. They're in the remotest parts of the state of New Hampshire. And I can tell you that many, many, many times I have pulled up on a site only to find people actually trying to cut the copper off of a television tower as they're broadcasting for stealing the cable that goes up, and yes, guns have been pulled on me many times. Now, lucky for me, I've never had to use mine, but I was certainly glad that I had one at the time. It does deter a certain amount of crime. I'll also tell you that I don't like to carry mine open because I would prefer that the other person not know that I'm prepared should they decide to do something. Carrying a gun carries a special uh, obligation and it's not something I take lightly, it's not something I pull. I'm not one of those people that would pull it and wave it. I only use it when I absolutely <clears throat> positively have to. But I have one in my vehicle all the time. My wife's father is 90 years old, lived up the street from us. He fell down, hit his head, and he was in pretty bad shape. One day I pulled into the house, left the car in the middle of the driveway. My wife came out and said, my dad's desperate, needs some certain medication jumped in my car and went to the pharmacy. Well, in the console was a loaded weapon. She doesn't have a carry permit. She was driving a vehicle and she had a concealed permit. Had she been stopped, because I know she was rushing, and she popped that open to get the, the registration, she didn't have a permit to be able to have it concealed. There's nothing wrong with my wife. She's not a criminal. In fact, she volunteers for more organizations, helps more people than anybody I know. One of the best people in the world, she just doesn't have a carry permit. She doesn't carry. But under the law, because she didn't have a permit, she would have been in trouble. And I talked to a lot of other people who have the same situation, and I don't think it's right. Why are we, why are we creating a problem for honest, good, hardworking citizens when we all know that the bad guy doesn't really care about the laws? He's not going to go ask you for permission and he's not going to care whether you give him permission. He's going to do whatever he wants to do. So I'm asking you to do the right thing, which is to take away the need for people to go and ask for permission. In any case, when we have certain people, <clears throat> we have uh, people who have tried to get permits, 14 days is well beyond the time that they need it. I'm talking about women and domestic violence, and I'm talking about people like myself who suddenly find themselves on a tower site with a gun in their face. It was after that that I got my permit. But it's not something I should have to do. I haven't done anything. I'm a good person, and there's still a lot of other people. So let's just make it so that good people can carry, and bad people under this law still can't. They can't possess a gun. They can't carry a gun, whether it's open or concealed. So let's take, out, let's take off that, that, that veil that makes people think that we're safer because we ask good people to prove that they're not a criminal. Then, Mr. Chairman, I'll take any questions. Yeah, you still got any questions. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
and also for the citizens who are able to, who are suitable people under the law. Um, on the second page are pistol and revolver licenses for my husband and myself. All three of them have errors because our police department is busy. They have a lot more important things to do than process these. They took a copy of my husband's license, even though it was unlawful, and still messed up his name. They messed up the amount of time that the license was supposed to be issued on my permit from 2007. And then they predated it on the most recent one and dated it three days before I brought it in. Not really important, but why should the police departments be doing all of this paperwork for suitable people who have no prob who have no reason to prohibit them from carrying? Um, basically, this, all this is going to do is trap people in a situation where, uh, where they are illegally carrying or not carrying when they perhaps should be. On Sunday, I went to a bridal shower and I picked up the mom to be. Um, I was also there with one of her friends from school who was up in a rental car, which is a lot more suitable for us driving around since I was in my husband's little Audi, which is not very good for a pregnant woman. Uh, we were about 15 minutes from her house when we got a flat tire. We're in Maine. I haven't filled out their six-page permit um, permit requirement, and I haven't paid them the $60, so my gun was home in the safe. Unfortunately, part of the tire changing apparatus was in the hands of whoever stole it from the rental company. So we had a tire and a jack, but we didn't have anything to turn it or to loosen the bolts. And the rental car company, when you buy the roadside insurance, they said it would be about two and a half hours. So here I am with a pregnant woman, another woman, and myself. I was in a skirt and heels because I thought we were going out um, on the side of the road with Florida license plates. I didn't have my gun on me since we were in, Mass in, we were in Maine, and I'm a law-abiding citizen, and I didn't want to violate their laws. So we were sitting there looking very vulnerable with the spare tire out, and fortunately, the two people that stopped for help, one of them was able to help us when we were on our way. But just like a fire extinguisher or a spare tire, a firearm is something that if you know how to use it, you can be pretty dangerous changing a tire if you don't know what to do either. Sometimes you're in a situation where you need to be able to use a tool. And you don't necessarily have to have the forethought to go through and do this process because on one of the few occasions when I travel to a certain state, even though I'm trained and licensed in my own state, I, I, would, I could have a problem if I'm found with it. And so that's an issue for my friends in Maine who haven't gotten a New Hampshire one because we don't have reciprocity between these states. And it's also an issue you know, if somebody just does hop in the car and doesn't have a permit. I, I really respect our police and our sheriffs. I really don't think that they should have to waste their time with this paperwork requirement in order to have a law which is currently on the books to codify this. I think that um, anybody who's not going to respect the law isn't going to respect the permit. And Really, are we worried about people who are violating a uh, carry law, or are we worried about people who are assaulting people? That is always going to be against the law, or else I'm going to be here petitioning you to make sure it is. We're talking about paperwork, and I respect them too much to waste their time. There was a comment about gangs from Ms. Uh, Ms. Schmidt. Take a look, our police have really important things they should focus on. We have a growing gang problem if you look at all of the graffiti that's around. Why don't we let them spend the time on that? instead of on processing our paper. Thank you. Seeing no questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Chris, is it Canterbury or something Campwell? like that? Probably got the name wrong. Yeah, it's, it's Chris Cantwell is my name. And basically, I just, I don't want this to be a crime. You know, I'm, I'm carrying a, a revolver. It's cold outside. I'm going to be able to put my coat on and not go to jail. Now, for me, it's not really a problem. I do, I do have a, uh, a, a revolver license in the state of New Hampshire. And I got it some time ago when I first moved here. It wasn't that big of a deal. I come from New York, and it's a pretty big deal to get one there. As a matter of fact, in New York... I was, uh, when I was 19 years old, I got caught with a stun gun. I didn't even realize it was illegal in New York, and I got charged with a, a weapons charge in New York. I ended up spending 60 days in jail over that. And it wasn't even a, a, a felony, it was a misdemeanor, but New York considers that a serious crime. And then some years later, I went to uh, purchase a, a shotgun for home defense, and New York 
had denied me to purchase a gun to have in my house. That was when I decided I had to get out of New York. And I ended up uh, coming to New Hampshire. So even the, uh, the very little restrictions that are uh, on, on weapons here in New Hampshire, it's a, it's, a, it's a breath of fresh air for me, but I do think that this is one example that we could take from Vermont. I wouldn't want to take any examples of taxes from Vermont, as some folks had <laughs> mentioned, but this is, this is one thing that Vermont is doing right. And I mean, as, especially for the, the, the Republicans here, I think for you know, uh, uh, Vermont to have you one-upped on guns is uh, crazy. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, it, most of the uh, uh, classic arguments about gun control have already been made. I'll just give you a couple of uh, practical examples. There was a, a friend of mine from Keene, his name is Derek Horton, and Derek had uh, engaged in a number of acts of civil disobedience. He was sort of trying to make a point about uh, government force. And so he had disobeyed uh, a number of uh, government edicts over in Keene, and he'd been arrested several times, and he actually ended up spending some time in jail. Now, nothing that Derek had done was uh, uh, violent, nothing that Derek had done victimized anybody, nothing that Derek had done was a felony. He's not prohibited from owning a firearm. He's not prohibited from openly carrying a firearm. However, the, the police chief in Keene had denied his, uh, his, his uh, uh, license to carry uh, basically because they felt that Derek was a person who was unsuitable to carry a weapon. Now, if you look at Derek, Derek's uh, 150, 160 pounds, he's like 5'9". He's the least intimidating figure that you could ever be. He's a gay kid, and he got, he was assaulted outside of the courthouse, right? We talk about law enforcement here to protect you. He got assaulted in front of a courthouse where you'd think it would be one of the safest places around, but he got assaulted by like five guys. Uh, and then he decided that he was, he, it was time for him to get a, a, a license to carry. And then uh, he, was, uh, he was subsequently denied. And Derek is uh, such a peaceful guy, he doesn't like the idea of carrying his, a pistol openly because he feels like it's intimidating and he wouldn't want to be uh, an intimidating figure. He's a, 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 it's been mentioned, peace-loving people. He's one of the most peace-loving people that you could ever imagine. He was a, a volunteer for Greenpeace, the ACLU, and all this stuff before he came here. So the least violent or intimidating person you could ever imagine, and he was denied because they, they deemed him to be unsuitable, and this was just some judgment call that was made by the police department and then upheld by uh, Judge Burke in, in, uh, in the court. And uh, I, I thought that was just so terrible, especially, you know, for me, I got my, my, uh, my permit, my license, uh, over, almost two years ago, and I could just imagine today, I'm a, I make my living as a, a talk show host and as a blogger, and I say very controversial things. I say things that upset a lot of people. I get death threats. And so, again, it's not too big of a deal for me because I do have the permit. I could just imagine, though, if I today applied and somebody who was making the judgment calls to whether or not I was a suitable person had read some of the things I said on my blog, the words that I had written, and decided that I was not a suitable person because they felt that I had said very controversial things. And that, that, uh, that would leave me... Uh, 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 subject to, to all of this intimidation that people try to uh, place on me uh, by, by call. I have a phone number on my website. I'm going to do a podcast one of these days called The Best of the Death Threats that people call me up and they say terrible things to me. And uh, so, and, and then practically speaking, when we, I mentioned the coat, we, we all know that. That's kind of crazy. It's New Hampshire. It's winter time. It gets cold outside. If you want to carry the way I carry, which is on the hip, it's, it, to put on a coat is, is a crime right now if you don't have a permit. If you uh, get into the car, when you get out of the car, so I carry a revolver. It might not be a big, as big a deal if you, if you have an automatic, but I just want you to picture for a second. So I get in my car, I take the bullets out of my revolver, and then I go to the bank and I get out of the car, and I start loading my revolver in the parking lot of the bank. Right? That, that, that conjures up some imagery that some folks might be uncomfortable with, you know? So. I, I, I think that it's important. There's another situation, a, a young lady I know uh, was recently charged for, uh, for carrying in her vehicle. She had her gun. She did openly carry it. She got in her car. She got pulled over. Uh, she had, I don't know, I don't think she was even aware that it was illegal for her to do it. She's driving around. It's, it's, she's been doing it for years. And you never had a problem. She just ha doesn't have that many run-ins with law enforcement. Gets pulled over. Gets charged with a misdemeanor. So uh, it seems to me that uh, this is a is Senate Bill 116 is a is a really common sense thing. Uh, if people are really that afraid of people 
having guns and carrying guns. You're more than welcome to people when I oppose government power, people always tell me, why don't you move to Somalia or something like this? Well, I already moved to New Hampshire. You know, I, I'm from New York. The place is a, a hellhole. If you think that gun control is a great thing, give it a shot in New York, ladies and gentlemen. Go try it. You want your taxes and your gun control? Believe me, there are plenty of places where you can go and have this, and it's not going to improve your quality of life. People are moving to this state from around the country and around the world to get a piece of the freedom that is still enjoyed by the people of this state. And when people try to uh, uh, restrict those freedoms, uh, they're throwing away something that is so precious and valuable, they don't even realize what they're giving up, I don't think. Because I don't think that they would do it if they, if they fully understood it. So I, I support Senate Bill 116. I haven't seen the amendment that some folks have mentioned. But anything to, uh, to free up uh, gun owners to protect themselves, to free up women to defend themselves, I think is, a, is an excellent, excellent measure. Uh, and, and I think that it ought to pass, and I'll take any questions. See no questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Matt McMillan. I know everybody's hungry. <laughs> I am too. My name is Matt McMillan. I'm from Nashville, New Hampshire. I wasn't um, I wasn't always a uh, concealed carry uh, advocate until um, <clears throat> in in Lowell. I used to live in Massachusetts. In Lowell, um, I was out with a group of three friends. Well, three, a group of us three, and we were visiting um, a band and. It was um, around six o'clock, and we got jumped because they thought that I was they thought that I was someone else. It was mistaken identity. And <clears throat> for for a while after that incident, um, you know, I, w I often wondered how could I how could I prevent something like that happening again? We were jumped by twelve people. Eight of them were on me. Um, they pushed me up against the wall, a brick wall, in a back alley. They uh, <coughs> they beat the crap out of me. <laughs> like it was it was probably one of the worst things I've ever had to endure. Um, somebody broke a, a bottle over my head. <coughs> I had glass everywhere. There were multiple bottles. Um, and we were left there, laying in the rain, with glass all around us. I had to get extensive uh, <coughs> dental work done, and <clears throat> I often wonder, you know, how how can you know I defend myself? And when I hear people say that firearms is not the best solution, what else? What else could have prevented that? I'm a peaceful person. I I I, I am extremely peaceful, but I think that firearms is a great equalizer. It really is. When you get right down to it, it promotes peace. <laughs> I am a graphic designer. And I'm also a wedding DJ. I'm also an inventor. I am I'm also a big supporter of the Second Amendment. And you know, as the founders intended it. It is a known fact that criminals will be criminals, you know, and they'll never obey any laws, no matter what laws you present. A person with ill intentions will not follow them, as this permit process does, does impede on law-abiding citizens' right to carry. Anyone with criminal background <coughs> will not go through the background check, either <coughs> at the point of sale or through the permit process. Eliminating this um, license to carry is not eliminating the background check at all. There is a reason why shall not be infringed is clearly stated in the Constitution. The founders knew that any compromise would definitely lead to more and more compromises until the right is no longer a right. Take a look at our neighbor in Massachusetts and a few other states where gun control has left uh, their areas with higher crime rates. I want to see New Hampshire to be continuing uh, to be a safe place. I moved, I've, I've moved from Massachusetts for this reason. And I respect New Hampshire. Um, and I do believe, as uh, someone else had mentioned, we are a nation of laws. And let it be known that I am a big believer in laws. 
I am also a big believer in innocent until proven guilty. The permit process is, in fact, a symbol of guilty until proven innocent. That's how I feel. That is absolutely how I feel. Where you need to ask permission to conceal carry. Aside from that, every firearm owner, every concealed carry and open carrier I know are some of the most integral, genuine, kind, and law-abiding citizens. They know the laws probably better than most lawyers. I doubt you can say the same to a criminal. They won't obey it anyway. So why inconvenience or potentially prohibit the good guys? I am asking you to please vote ought to pass SB 116 because I think it is about time we stick to the intentions of both federal and state constitution. I'm open for a question. I don't see any questions. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, guys. Michelle, is it Lavelle? Yes, thank you. Is it morning? No, it's afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Michelle Lavelle. I am here to represent the Women's Defense League of New Hampshire. I did submit written testimony, so I'll keep my remarks brief. Um, but some people earlier in the hearing suggested that if people want to carry, go ahead, do so openly. There's a reason why law-abiding citizens may choose not to open carry. It's a term called swatting. It's when people who intend to draw law enforcement to either a location or to a person who is not disobeying the law. Sometimes it's to pull a prank, but sometimes, as in the case of an Ohio young man who was gunned down at a Walmart, it's intentionally to hurt people who might be carrying. In this Walmart incident, it was a young man carrying an airsoft gun. Now, New Hampshire is not immune to this. There have been four examples of swatting in New Hampshire just since December. I ask you, please consider the law-abiding citizens who have every good reason why they would not want to open carry. Why put themselves and the people they're with at risk? Why should they expose themselves to that and frankly, it's, it's a bad situation for law enforcement. Not only are they coming to a, a, a false situation with uh, their resources, expecting it to be a dangerous situation when it's not, but it's drawing them away from areas that need their attention. Uh, so I would ask you to please consider swatting as a very valid reason why people would not want to open carry. So I would urge you, please support 116. Uh, either as originally submitted or as amended. <coughs> they're, they're both solid, and I would ask for you to consider that. Thank you. Seeing no questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Joel Weintraub. I get it wrong. I get it wrong all the time. That's all right, sir. I've been my name has been butchered since I was big. Thank you, folks. For your time again today. My name is Joel Winery, but I live in Belmont, New Hampshire. Um, a couple things that I want to address that's already been discussed with you folks is, uh, again, the Constitution, which has been mentioned. Um, right now, on the national level, they're trying to have reciprocation across the entire country. But at one point, about a decade ago, they found that police officers were having that same problem. Because when they went on vacation, they didn't mean they couldn't run into people that they had arrested before. So the federal government made it so that lawful, lawful law enforcement people could carry anywhere inside the country when they were off duty. And also be able to carry after they retired from the responsibilities in law enforcement because evil still follows them. A lot of people are nervous that people have firearms. Um, one of the representatives that's in the room here, when the bill was before you from the House bill, was down on the lunch line. And he turned to one of the other House of Representatives 
I mentioned that he couldn't go to an NRE meeting because he would be shot. Needless to say, he didn't realize that my sweetheart, Representative LeBrick, was standing beside him and said, you know, I wouldn't shoot you, sir. I was endorsed by the NRA. No one that's in this room, including the state police officer who carries a gun every day for his job, wants to shoot another human being. The responsibilities of self-preservation was given to us by our Lord to protect ourselves. Again, the people that carry firearms, 99.9% .9 of them are very, very responsible citizens. We have people in this room that are veterans who have served their entire lives protecting this country. We have members that sit on this board that have been former law enforcement people who have put their life in harm's way every single day. But they will also attest that they can't be everywhere all the time. Uh, again, the background checks that go through this state for people who get a firearm is a pretty extensive one. Uh, the sergeant has testified before that he does lots of them. They come from the gun shops. People get certified through that auspice to be able to purchase these firearms. Uh, the Senate passed this, and I'll keep it short. I think that you should abide by their wishes and put this bill forward uh, and uh, help the citizens of the state of New Hampshire become a safe, safer environment. I had some people that were in the state house about the same time this bill was being discussed with a house bill, and they were from France. And they were in looking at the hall of flags. And so I was showing them around a little while I was on my way to go get Sherry's motor vehicle so she didn't have to freeze get into the parking lot. And uh, one of the things I did after I had walked around and talked to them for a few minutes is I pulled back my coat. And I let them see that I was carrying a firearm. Of course, they were a little, you know, because in France they don't have that right. And I told them that everybody here, for the most part, a great population carry a firearm. And they were like, is there a lot of crime here? And I said, no, that's why there is no crime here. Because the bad guys know that there may be a law-abiding citizen who carries a firearm. And I told them, so if they were in a restaurant and someone pulled off their coat or their sweater, and they saw that someone had a firearm on, not to get worried. Or if they saw it in someone's hand, then yes, there would be need for concern. But if it's going to a restaurant or wherever, uh, um, not to worry about that. This past week, a gentleman used a firearm. Citizens use firearms all the time to protect other people. There was an altercation going on in business in another state, and the gentleman had taken a gun out where there was children in the barber shop and randomly just started shooting. By chance, one of the patrons was coming through the door who was lawfully in possession of a firearm and licensed to do such, terminated that gentleman's activities within a second left 13 other people to still be alive today. So the people that carry firearms, this is probably the safest place in, place in the state of New Hampshire right now with all the people that are in the firearms. I'm quite sure that there would be no terrorists that would want to come in here or anyone that had any rude, uh, crude reason to want to cause grievous bodily harm to any other human being would want to step into this room. That would be their demise. And again, I truly believe that the people that represent the state of New Hampshire are some of the greatest citizens in the world because they take their freedoms seriously. And the words live free or die are just not a model. They're a way of life to all these people. And um, I want to thank you all for all the time that you folks spent. I thank all the citizens of the state of New Hampshire should have to follow all your representatives around for a day so they can see the toil that you put forth every single day and the decisions that you make that face you in these committees and other committees throughout the entire state house. And they should be grateful that they have as many people that are willing to take the time and set forth to be the representatives that you are here to make these decisions. And hopefully you'll always make the sound ones and the best ones for the citizens of the state of New Hampshire. And I'd like to thank you for your time very, very much. Any questions? Thank you very much. Sylvia Gale.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. I know it's late. You've been here a really long time as a former representative. I thank you for your service. Um, I, I'm here today to read into the record um, my friend and former constituent's testimony. This is her story. This is not my story, but I do have a little add-on of my own at the end. My name is Deidre Reynolds. I've lived in Nashua, New Hampshire for 24 years. My husband and I are both gun owners who fully support and take advantage of our Second Amendment rights. My husband is a sportsman who enjoys taking both of our children, who are both daughters, by the way, with him to the gun range to teach them how to safely use firearms like his father showed him. SB 116 has been called the Women's Rights Bill, which is very odd, since it really has nothing to do with women's rights specifically, other than invoking our gender and using the serious issue of domestic violence to get the bill passed. Current law requires anyone who desires to legally carry a concealed loaded gun to fill out a brief um, pistol permit application, which is easily acquired, drop it off at their local police station. The permit must be issued within 14 days, is good for four years, and the fee is a nominal $10. In Nashua, it takes as little as seven days to receive <coughs> such a permit. SB 116 constitutional carry does away with this law and would allow anyone to carry a loaded concealed gun. As one law enforcement <coughs> official who testified against the bill to the committee previously said, this would allow kids 13, 14 years old to carry guns concealed because there is no minimum age in New Hampshire. Simply by carrying a written letter from a parent authorizing their permission is all it would take to allow minors to carry a loaded concealed firearm without any input from law enforcement should this bill pass. <coughs> repealing, the, the, repealing the permit law would also take away law enforcement's ability to deny a concealed carry license to individuals who are a danger to themselves or others. This could range from someone who's been in numerous bar fights and ability to carry a, meeting, a loaded concealed gun is questionable to a domestic abuser who has not yet been formally invited. SB 116 would do more harm than good and I urge this committee to reject it. On my own behalf, as Sylvia Gale, I want to just add that I am an, an a feminist activist, proudly, have worked on behalf of victims of domestic and sexual violence and child abuse in this state for 35 years, and I have to strongly take exception to the previous testifiers who, depri depri who um, labeled this a women's right bill and talk about the need to have immediate relief for protection for domestic violence victims and survivors. There's so much I could say about that, but your time is precious and I won't go into it. But I strongly urge you on my own behalf, as well as Jesus, please reject SD 116 and her testimony is here tonight. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Ian Freeman. Well, good afternoon. Thanks for uh, being here and paying attention. Uh, so I want to tell you a little bit more about my friend Derek Horton. Chris Cantwell mentioned uh, his story earlier. As he mentioned, he's the real thin, kind of built like me, uh, gay guy who was attacked in the streets of Keene. Uh, he believes in the right to bear arms, and he's willing to do that, but he's not willing to do it openly um, because of you know various different concerns about yeah. what people you know, might think about that. Plus, it's, uh, he's also very fashionable, uh, and so he doesn't want to uh, carry a gun openly. It can be difficult to do that in the winter time as well. So he was denied uh, by the Keene Police Chief, Ken Miola, uh, his supposed right to, uh, to carry. And if you have a right, then you shouldn't have to ask permission. So by the virtue of the fact that you're asking permission is proof that you really aren't exercising a right. So I, I think that uh, this law needs to change. We need to have more freedom to carry. So he was denied. He appealed to uh, the Keene District Court, which is supposedly his right. He hired the best of the best attorney, uh, Evan Knappen. He's well known uh, in New Hampshire and New Jersey as being sort of the, the, the king of uh, gun rights uh, attorneys. And not even Evan Knappen could, uh, could help him restore his rights in Keene District Court. He paid, you know, I think, $2,500, which was a, uh, a reduced rate for Evan and his services. And uh, you know, he was still denied. Now, again, he's not violent. He's never harmed anybody. He has a couple of minor convictions for civil disobedience. And what was actually said during this trial was really interesting as far as the reasons why uh, Keene police considered him to be unsuitable. 
basically they don't like him because he's a critic. He hosts a radio show that is critical of police abuse, of police who have overstepped their bounds, police who have harmed peaceful people. And because he's critical of the police, the police said essentially that uh, he should not be able to concealed carry a firearm. And I find that a really disturbing, chilling effect on free speech, essentially the idea being that if you speak out against police corruption, if you speak out against police abuse, that all of a sudden you don't have a right to defend yourself anymore, which I find absolutely scary. And so he's now going to appeal this decision of this, uh, the district court to New Hampshire Supreme Court, which of course is going to cost him probably another $2,500. So when all is said and done, presuming the Supreme Court actually rules in his favor and who knows what they'll end up doing, he's going to be into this $10 pistol permit for about $5,000, not to mention countless hours of his time. And of course, he still can't, in the meantime, while he's waiting for these decisions to come down, uh, he still can't conceal carry and protect himself. So that's just one example of what I'm sure are a myriad of people who have been denied their supposed right to conceal carry because of this awful uh, law that we currently have. So I'd like to encourage you to pass this bill. And thank you very much. Thank you. Does he carry the gun openly, which he can legally? He uh, prefers not to do that. He's considered um, taking that step, but in the wintertime, it's very difficult to carry a, a firearm openly, uh, you know, on top of bulky clothing and things like that. So it's just not really practical. Thank you very much. My name is Andrew Rice Hawkins. I'm the Executive Director of Brain State Progress. I did testify on the House version of this bill, so I'll keep my remarks short today and just pass out an um, additional copy of that testimony to you as well. I did want to just say for the record um, that New Hampshire's current law requires an individual to be a suitable person, allowing for denial of a concealed carry license when there's reason to believe a person is dangerous. I think it makes perfect sense if somebody is a danger to themselves or others, or they be denied the ability to concealed carry a weapon. Our organization is opposed to SB 116. We do find the amendment slightly better, but overall this bill um, is not a good public safety policy for New Hampshire. I did want to follow up on one other thing that has kind of come to light as this conversation has continued, and that's the issue of reciprocity as well. I think it's a um, unique concern that this committee itself recognized during the House version of this bill that um, currently New Hampshire has reciprocity agreements with 22 states. There is a question about whether or not we'd be able to continue those arrangements should New Hampshire go with its public safety laws. I did a glance through um, what some of the other states require for their own laws and also um, the states that they uh, allow reciprocity with. And I think that this is, is an area the committee really should look at and consider for the rights of gun owners in our state. Um, along with that, we do have four states that recently um, rejected similar legislation. Those include West Virginia, Mississippi, and Utah, um, all of which New Hampshire currently has reciprocity with. And then another one, Virginia, which um, this legislation specifically encourages our state to try to seek additional um, uh, licensing arrangements with those states that we don't have. So we should take a look at that. It is a serious concern, and I don't think it um, benefits the overall aim of, uh, of this legislation. And with that, I will pass out copies of the testimony I provided last time. I also have with me um, the testimony from several individuals who unfortunately couldn't make it today but wanted to um, put their comments in opposition to this bill on record. I'll quickly read their names. William Kingston from Newcastle, Deborah C.B. Howard from Manchester, Katie DeRochers, also from Manchester, and Cheryl Cruz, also from Manchester. Um, those last three individuals are all members of um, Mom's Demand Action and have been following this bill <coughs> as well. And happy to take any questions that can be asked. I just have one. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman, and thank you for your testimony. 
the the uh, issue of public safety comes up continually in this testimony, and I, I just basically have one question, and that would be how does uh, either uh, one or any of us on this committee carrying a concealed loaded weapon constitute a public safety threat? I don't think that you do if you've been issued a license. I think the issue comes up. Um, no, that excuse me, I didn't mention license. That if you have a concealed carry. Well, currently you would have to have a license in New Hampshire concealed carry or else you would be breaking the law, which I would hope that none of our legislators sitting here today would be doing. Um, I would say that I think it's important that we have the opportunity for local law enforcement to provide that mechanism of ensuring that those who've been legally uh, issued the license to conceal carry are people who are upstanding citizens in the community and don't pose a threat. I think some of the examples we've heard today, like um, the individual who testified previously, um, the members of the Free State Project down in Keene who are concerned about one of their members being denied a license. I think that we have recourse in our state that if somebody's denied, they have the ability to go through a process and if the courts find that they have been wrongly denied that license, they'll be issued it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for coming today. Uh, in the 93 years that this law has been in effect, through the research you've done in your organization, has it ever led to a gun registry in the state of New Hampshire? It is not, and actually gun registry is, um, is prohibited by several uh, federal and state laws. Thank you. Wait, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative DeSess opened the door here, and I, I think I'm going to walk through. Uh, you, said there has, uh, you said there has never been a gun registry in the uh, state of New Hampshire due to the 92 years of this law, yet the gentleman from Auburn says uh, his uh, city council, town council, published a list of all the permit holders in his town in the paper, and he had to take them to court over it. If there is no gun registry, how do they have a list of all the gun, the, uh, gun permit holders? It's an excellent question. So a gun registry would entail having every single gun purchased or transferred to the state of New Hampshire listed in a centralized place. Concealed carry license is actually something different than a gun registry. Um, it may surprise the committee that given um, my strong stance on gun violence prevention, <coughs> personally, um, my organization and myself, we don't agree with publishing lists of, of those who do have um, those licenses or um, who do have guns because we think it presents a public safety issue in letting folks know exactly which houses to go to if they wanted to steal a, a firearm. Um, that, uh, I would say that the other side of that is if you're a parent um, and you're concerned about whether or not your child be around firearms, I think that that does present a concern that we've heard some people voice, but that personally an organization is where we come from. <coughs> Further questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. Good afternoon. I, I wasn't planning on speaking today, but there were uh, some women who brought up the issue of this being a feminist uh, issue or a women's rights issue. And I've had a lot of experiences in my life that I'll share with you. One of them was when I was 12 years old, my mother had a violent boyfriend, and the way she dealt with, this, with that was at that point, because she feared for her life, we moved to the other side of the country under a trial secrecy. This experience gave me a lot to think about. I never really do recall ever fe a feeling safe in my life, because women are, are just naturally more vulnerable. Uh, as an adult, I worked at a radio station in a very remote area of Manchester. Um, there's a man talking about radio stations. That place used to creep me out because it was around a swampy area. It was very remote, and I thought, this, this looks like a place where I would be vulnerable. Making the situation worse was that when I went to work, the other disc jockeys that were on would leave the windows open so that they could smoke. The first thing I had to do when I was all alone in the, that building from midnight to 6 a.m. was run around, lock doors, and close windows. Well, my, my instincts must have been right because a few years later they found a, a, a decomposing body in the swamp near that, that area. And that woman was killed by a hammer. She was not killed by a gun. 
I, uh, I would like to add another thing. I have a friend who did live through a time in his life where uh, guns were taken from everyone in his country and there was genocide and he lost many members of his family. He's a physicist now. I'm not exactly sure why he enjoys shooting so much. It may be because he's a physicist. Uh, but it may be also because of how he grew up in Cambodia. He tells, he tells us that we have no idea what we have and that we should protect it with all that we have. So that's why I decided I'm going to come up and I'm going to speak. There are other women that feel differently about this situation. They don't think it's a woman's rights issue. I just wanted to tell you my life experience. And uh, you can make it your own Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, there's a question well, the only thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. I think I can propose, but would you definitely state whether you're in favor or opposed to Oh, I'm in favor. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Last but not least, we get to one of the sponsors of the bill, Representative Hall. Wow. <laughs> I'll see if I can do this in less than 10 minutes, because that's really what I signed up for. I know. Okay. So, I'm just going to summarize the points and not reiterate them that I've heard, right? People have made points about the differences between open carry and concealed carry, and how concealed carry is a safer form of carry. It um, doesn't elicit the emotional response. It doesn't create the issues of loading a revolver or walking into a bank or into a mall. Um, People have made comments about the fact that officers are spending time doing paperwork, okay, versus being out on the street. Um, people have made points about the fact that when this was put in place, it was suitable, the term suitable was there, and it was a profiling bill regarding certain ethnic minorities at the time, in particular Irish. Um, why do you do this? People have made points about, um, and this applies to me because I have a carry permit, my wife does not. Very late. Apologize, and my wife does not. If she were to drive my car and my range bag was in the trunk, she would be guilty of a misdemeanor. It affects those from Vermont who travel through the state, who arguably, because of how we manage our out-of-state licenses, um, may not be able to get one because they can't bring a license from the home state. It affects for, um, other travelers through the state, Maine, Massachusetts, um, if they um, are traveling through the state and they're concealing they concealed carry in their car, for instance, a firearm, they could be breaking a law that they're not aware of. People probably have talked about, I didn't hear all the testimonies, the Supreme Court decision resulting from books it, okay, where the Supreme Court basically said this, the state um, police and the local law enforcement now have much more authority than they ever had or was ever delegated by the legislature in the past. I don't know if people talked about Form 4473. Um, which, if you fill out a Form 4473, and the reason I, I bring this up is not because this is a background check bill, but I want to talk about enforcement of laws on the books. 4473 on page two, top, starts, I also understand that making any false oral or written statement or exhibiting any false or misrepresentation of identification with respect to the transaction is a crime punishable by felony. I'm going to turn in the ATF background checks for the last 20 years. There have been several million people who have gone through background checks. If you look at Table 9, there are several hundred thousand who were denied, who were never prosecuted. Are we going to deal with the fact that people who are breaking the law, okay, aren't being prosecuted, or we're just continuing to punish the law by Most of the officers, yet another point, came in armed today, okay? Most of them who have, have jobs. I don't know if every department requires this. Most of them are supposed to carry when they're off duty as well. Um, why is that? Because it's hard to be in, involved and interact and to stop a violent crime if you're not prepared. Um, when this, when a prior bill, Table 9 was the one that I just mentioned. It's near the end, and I circled the information. It's like three pages in from the back or something. It's more than that. Um, it's page nine in the printout, right? Mm -hmm. And I circled the 331,000 people had a felony conviction when they applied for um, to purchase 
yeah, we're, we're, we are effectively um, going after almost none of them. Um, when this bill was before the Senate, I talked about response time when it comes to shootings. How the, and this is again FBI data, okay? Because the average response time is several minutes at a minimum, over five minutes in many cases, okay? Um, sorry, the shooting is over within within two minutes in most cases, and five in almost all cases. He has a response time of police is really close to that. Okay, that's a real problem. Our kids matter. Guess what? If someone were to come into this room, I'm reasonably certain there would be a, a reasonably good response based on who I see in the committee, who I know is behind me, okay? There wouldn't be mass mayhem. But that's not true in my school. That's not true in a bunch of other places. That's not true in shopping centers and libraries and malls, okay? Grocery stores. Um, the only way we're gonna solve this based on the, based on the testimony before about um, calling people, if they're open caring, hey, that's a danger. And, 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 and this thing, term called swatting, that's only gonna get worse. Concealed carry solves that. It doesn't necessarily employ the police to go after a nonviolent crime, okay, where there is no crime, when they could be busy doing other real, um, other real work to help public safety. Um, I can't speak for the women in the group, but I've heard both women on both sides. I will say that there was a, a, a man, a Miss Amanda Collins from the University of Nevada, okay, who was raped very close to campus security several years ago, okay? Her rapist then went on to rape and murder some others. Um, she stands up and says, you know what? I had a carry license. I wish I could have been carrying on campus. Maybe it's time to rethink the problem that we should let people protect themselves. People brought up issues about New Hampshire reciprocity. There's not gonna be no, any issues with new this reciprocity because the license still stays in place. There's no issues there. Someone brought up concerns about West Virginia and the fact that the governor, a Democrat, by the way, just vetoed the bill, but it passed the why assembly. Does, excuse me, point of order. Why does politics come into this? Why do you say a Democrat? He's an elected governor. Okay, he's an elected governor, but the House, the House or the Assembly passed it 7129. Okay. But he was an elected the official. The Senate passed uh, it 32. Point of order on that point of order, Mr. Chairman. The Senate passed it 32. Yes, uh, I don't think we're supposed to have bantering, sir. We're not supposed to have any debate. Thank you, sir. And point of honor, sir, mm -hmm. yes. uh, oh the, the Republicans and Democrats are not supposed to be divided in a committee. <laughs> they are supposed to be respected as representatives. Well, what their party affiliation well, is their business. On this committee, I think that's true. <coughs> right. And some perhaps don't subscribe to that. And some do. That's the way it is in the world. You may continue. She makes an excellent point. It doesn't matter what party he's part of, okay? But he was a governor, he vetoed it, but it was over it was supported seventy one twenty nine in their assembly, which is effectively their house, okay, which is well over anything close to a two thirds, which would be a ruling uh, a New Hampshire constitutional argument. And the Senate was thirty two two okay for the bill that was discussed it may in fact we don't know because it was only vetoed last week whether there's an override um, it only takes two-thirds of them to call for a special session to override it we heard about concerns about our gun registry it's true there's the list that was published in that one town i know dunbarton publishes not the names but the number of licenses every year in their annual book um, if you listen to scanners, there's discussions on scanners, whether that person has a license issued to them or not. There's a lot of reasons to pass this bill. Um, lastly, it's not a straight Second Amendment bill. Everybody talks about the Second Amendment, goes beyond that. In our Constitution, we have natural rights, we have constitutional rights, and we have civil rights. And let us not forget the differences between them. Okay, a natural right, the ability to protect yourself is irrespective of the Constitution. It trumps the Constitution. Constitutional rights are what our government grants to us. The ability to protect yourself trumps that, okay? Article three makes it clear, if they're not doing the job to protect us, and the Supreme Court has ruled on this, okay, that a police does not have to get involved, even in the case of a domestic violence issue where um, 
the boyfriend was stalking the female, okay? They did, the police had no, had no obligation to get involved. Um, they're null and void under Article Three. So this is a natural right and a constitutional right. It goes to both, okay? Civil rights are what we grant our citizens when it comes to rules and regulations. With that, I'll close my testimony. I hope we made it under 10 minutes. Thank you. you did well. It's been a long day. Any questions? We have one more. Sorry, we're both. Well, we have two more. <laughs> Either that or there's a kind of agenda change. <laughs> First, I want to say thank you, Chairman and committee. Um, this is going to be my first time ever getting in front of anybody and testifying anything. So bear with me, okay? I'm in support of this bill. Um, I come from a background of abusive situations. And I think it's a right of every citizen to be able to protect himself. I had to watch my mother get abused. And I was only six years old during that time. I was in crutches. I was pushed to the side. And I had to see all this when I was young. And then another time, um, my brother was stabbed. OK. I was raised in Hartford, Connecticut, in uh, the city. And it's, it's very, very hard as a child to be living there. So there are other situations that I had to deal with growing up. And I just feel that it's a right of every citizen to be able to protect themselves. You know, I don't go out and I'm not going to go out and get revenge or anything like that. But um, if you take that right away from somebody, the chances are that you are giving the criminals the upper hand and this world is going to be worse than it is it's already getting there. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, it's really bad. Um, I just feel that, that we should be able to keep our amendments. And I am a constitutionalist, and I believe in the Second Amendment. Don't take this away. Let us protect ourselves, because you never know what's going to come up in front of you. And I've seen too much of it. And I think that if you don't give that person that freedom, <coughs> chances are you are going to enable her or him. And I am for the second amendment. I just feel that don't take it away. Keep it just the way it is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Peter. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. Are you in with that? Yes. Yes. Now you'd indicated on here that you had ten minutes. Hopefully not because the cafeteria closes at two o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, if I put if I no, I don't want to interrupt at at a good meeting. Uh, thank you for having me this afternoon and having all of us actually. Uh, I heard that a lot of these uh, presentations, they talk about rules, regulations, and uh, constitutions, and all kinds of things. I think this bill is more like a choice. Everybody has a choice. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're wrong. Still, it's your choice. I come from a country in which I lived for 40 years at the dictatorship. I don't mind to say it, I came from Argentina. I lived at the Peron for 40 years. I was in jail. I was 16 years old. My crime, I was putting posters on the walls for the other guy. I just happened to have a relative who had 10 fingers, 11 pies, and imagine to have one finger in every pie. He cut me out. He called some famous. When I was 25, I came over here. That was my choice. I came on 61. A year to the day, I got called into the service. That was not my choice. 
but I got to go. Why? I felt that I kind of, I kind of took reason not to go at the time. It was an agreement between the United States and Argentina going back to 1870. Either, either members from either country with a military serve in the country of origin will not have to serve in the country, in the country of adoption. It was a cut and dry thing. I, could, I should have gone to the board and say, hey, this is the situation. I'm out of here. I didn't want to Canada either. I decided that if I was going to live, live on this country, I was going to abide by this country. It was my choice. I was one of the ones that they were not there in Vietnam. We were never in Laos. So I wasn't there. I came out. I decided 14 years later, I decided to go back in. I finished my 20s. They gave me another present before leaving. They sent me to the sandbox. I put my comment. There's a storm, came out. I'm a proud veteran. When I was living in Argentina, I didn't have choices. I went through two revolutions over there. And here I have choices. One of my choices is to have a weapon. Why? I feel comfortable with it. I know what to use it. My wife does feel comfortable with it. She knows how to use it. We are both educated in what and how to use it. And the complications and problems that they will come if and when we use it. I'm talking about terminal mm -hmm. shooting. Neither one of us is prone to go in a rampage. Four of my five neighbors, they are all carried, both men and women. I don't I see any shootouts at my neighbor I've been living there for 20 years. <laughs> I was in New York, giving up state. I had a New York state license. Why? Because I had a bad divorce at the time, and I was threatened by one of her kids. Stupidly, he left a message on my answering machine. So I went to see the judge with the, with the tape. No problem. I came over here. I was traveling back and forth. And having been licensed in New York, I got from the state police in here, I got an other time license for reciprocity. New York won't give me one back. But I got one here. That was my choice. I don't see why it's a big problem. I carry. I'm carrying right now. I don't leave the house without it. I carry it inside the house most of the time. And a couple of times they came handy. About a month, a month and a half ago, 11 o'clock at night, I, somebody rang the bell in my house. People who knows me, knows my wife, they don't come ringing the bell unless they call ahead. Mm. <laughs> you can understand why. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rule. It's a rule. You don't just show up. Or at least we identify yourself who you are on the other side of the door before if it's an emergency. My neighbors know. We do that back and forth. We watch each other's places when we go away. We all have guns at the house. And that's what happened. I opened the inside door, the outside door was locked. Of course, I'm very obvious what I'm doing because it's, it's so shown. There was some guy asking for directions. I don't think he was too interested on the directions when he left because he went the other way. <laughs> I, I live right in the corner, so from my corner you can make only two ways. Right or left? That was his choice. He picked the wrong one. As it turned out to be, everything was taken care of. But it was at that point, it was my right to protect my family. 
my neighbor had a similar situation. The only thing is she doesn't carry, but she has a shotgun. So when she went and grabbed the shotgun, the three guys that they were com coming in turned around and were left. I guess they were not interested on, fat, on, on her, you know, visiting. But this is the problem. We all have to be aware of what's going on around us. We all have to be aware of what's going on around my, your friends and neighbors and be prepared. And that's what it is, it's education and it's choices. It is not so much about rules, regulations, and what have you. The bad guy doesn't care about rules, regulations, education, or anything. He has a gun, he's going to use it. He has a baseball bat, he's going to try to beat the hell out of you. We had cases here in Manchester. I live in Manchester. And we had cases. A guy that is in a wheelchair right now, he got jumped and beat with a baseball bat. So, we should regulate the import bats. We should regulate cars because people drive drunk and hit all the people and kills. So that we should regulate. See, if we look for a, a scapegoat, gentlemen, ladies, we are going to find it. I don't care if it's a goat, a ewe, or a cow. We're going to find somebody responsible or something responsible. We can't live under regulation. We are free country. People in this country talks about freedom. They have no clue what they're talking about. In this country, we haven't had to fight for our freedom since 1776. And they've been born into it. So, from somebody who's seen the rules from both sides, I've seen the world from both sides, I've seen them around the country, around the world both civilian and military, please support SB 116 because that is going to give the people a choice. You want to carry open, you can carry open. You don't want carry open, you can carry concealed. You want a license? Fine, go get it. You don't want a license? It's fine with you. It's a choice. Not always the best one but it will be always your choice. And let's leave the politics outside, let's leave the name callings outside, and believe me, <coughs> Representative GPO, I am a God loving too. I, I like this. I've been on the other side and I know what peace and bad is. But if I had a choice between my family and peace, peace is going to lose. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, then we have no more cards. Oh. 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 Well, we can go to lunch. Mm -hmm. Is Representative Fields paying? <laughs> we are too. <laughs> well, uh, for lunch? Uh, lunch. Oh. Is there going to be any? Well, we're not staying now. No, I'm hoping you. Oh,